Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where we have unusually in-depth conversations about the world's most pressing problems, what you can do to solve them, and why my autobiography would be filled with spreadsheets. I'm Rob Woodlin, Head of Research at 80,000 Hours. We sometimes get requests to include more personal stories on this podcast, and today's guest, Leah Garces, has an incredible one about her efforts to end factory farming. Uh, I was keen to see if I could learn any broader lessons uh, from the various times that she's formed constructive and, and warm relationships uh, with folks who would normally be her adversaries. Uh, like the chicken farmer who opened his doors to reveal the horrors of his own farm, uh, or the executive at a big meat company uh, who was once the villain in one of Leah's viral videos. But this episode isn't just, or even mostly, uh, about Leah's personal story. Uh, I was especially excited to realize that Mercy for Animals' strategy uh, was pretty different uh, than what I had thought, which then made a lot of other things a bit clearer. You'll hear me get the unifying story behind their whole approach around 35 or 40 minutes into the interview. Leah and I also talk about uh, why conditions for farmers are so bad, uh, the benefits of creating a public ranking and scoring companies against one another, uh, the difficulty of enforcing corporate pledges, uh, and much more besides. All right, without further ado, here's Leah Garces. Today, I'm speaking with Leah Garces. Leah has been president of Mercy for Animals since 2018 and is the author of Grilled, Turning Adversaries into Allies to Change the Chicken Industry. Over the last 10 years, Leah has first pressured and then collaborated with people in the US chicken industry. That partnership had the immediate goal of stopping the caging of egg-laying hens and the confinement of chickens raised for meat in dense, unsanitary conditions, and the longer-term goal of reducing the suffering the U.S. food system causes to both non-human animals and humans as well. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Wired, and the Ezra Klein Show, among many other places. And before working at Mercy for Animals, Leah led Compassionate World Farming in the United States, worked at the World Society for the Protection of Animals, and originally studied zoology at the University of Florida. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Leah. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to chat with you today. I hope we'll get to talk about what lessons we might be able to learn from your book, Grilled, and what programs Mercy for Animals operates and why. But first off, as always, uh, what are you working on at the moment and why do you think it's important? All right. Well, the first big project I have right now is our three-year strategic plan. It's our global strategic plan where we lay out the priorities for the organization and decide what kind of impact and why we're choosing those pieces. Uh, so that's critical because that will drive the entire organization and how we make decisions and dividing up resources and what kind of impact we hope to have. The second big thing is a Costco campaign. So early February, we launched an undercover investigation into the conditions of broiler chickens in a Costco farm. And then we launched a national campaign against Costco, trying to get them to adopt better standards. And we've had hundreds of media outlets covering the story. We had Nicholas Kristof break the story in the New York Times, and it had huge coverage. And we're partnering with other organizations to amplify the pressure. And then the third thing is a Southeast Asia expansion, which we can talk more about, but you know, a fifth of all farmed animals alive are confined in factory farms in Southeast Asia and East Asia. So it's a good place for us to think about moving into. How does it feel to be kind of turning the screws on a, on a company like Costco or creating lots of, lots of hassles, I suppose, for, the, for their PR people? Is it exciting or yeah, do you have more mixed feelings about it? Oh no, it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> you know, I think you know, coming a year out of the pandemic where it was really hard to put pressure on companies, especially a lot of these companies that were pulling back or having to furlough staff. Grocery stores were not in that category. Grocery stores experienced incredible growth, record sales. Costco was one of those. And then we got an undercover investigation and it felt so great. We had been sitting down with them for you know, a year or so with no, no real progress to speak of. And so it was time, it was really time to put pressure on. Yeah. If I remember right from my interview a couple of months ago with Louis Ballard, I thought that um, Costco was actually a leader, at least in, in some dimension of making a pledge on an animal welfare, but it, but it sounds like now you're still having to, to, to pressure them a lot. What, what's the story there? Yeah, so they are a leader on, that's a good, good memory, uh, cage-free eggs. So, okay. And actually, we're kind of following that example. And it, I think it was 2015, the movement launched a undercover investigation against Costco and a major national campaign against Costco to get them to adopt a cage-free egg policy. And it took better part of a year to get them to do so. They said they would, but they wouldn't put a timeline on it. And now today, they are nearly 100% cage-free on their eggs, including in Mexico. They're almost entirely cage-free. So they're actually, I think that's the right kind of trajectory for a company. If they've done cage-free eggs, then they're ready to start broilers because that's the next frontier. 
So they're a good target in that sense. Yeah. It sounds like broiler chickens might be the harder sell to take to companies like this. I mean, I'm kind of surprised that Costco has been willing to be so yeah, advanced on the cage one, but it sounds like they're dragging their heels. Are you really having to put pressure on them on the, on the, on the broiler chickens? Yeah. I mean, when we talk about factory farming, we're talking about broilers. We're talking about chickens that we eat for meat because 90% of all the animals, individuals that we eat are their land animals are chickens. So it's the biggest amount economically that companies are, are benefiting from and dealing with. So it's also because there's so many animals, you know, even like small changes, multiply that by 9 billion and it's gonna cost a lot. So all the changes we're asking them to make do cost money. On top of that, Costco in particular is using chickens, their rotisserie chicken as a loss leader. So they sell it at $4.99 for a rotisserie chicken. And they even have this whole, they have a public outward strategy for drawing people into the store through this rotisserie chicken to get you to buy a TV or a kayak or something like that. And we're saying, please don't use a sentient being as your loss leader. Use a kayak instead or use something else that doesn't have feelings. And, you know, I think it, it's hard for them to take the loss leader and put the real cost into it. And it's, then it's even harder to make them do what would be right for the animals. All right. We'll come back to uh, that campaign and the other things that uh, Mercy for Animals is up to uh, just uh, later in the interview. But first off, yeah, let's talk about your book Grilled, which came out in 2019. Yeah, in, in that book, you cover, I guess, a lot of ground about your personal background, your work over the last couple of decades and how you've had uh, various successes over the years. I guess for our conversation, I'm keen to focus in on the cases where you formed quite constructive relationships with folks like chicken farmers and executives at big meat companies, which is, uh, which is somewhat surprising. And these kind of relationships flourished uh, somewhat against the odds. I guess to start, could you lay out a few of the people who you collaborated with and how those relationships came to be and what positive results uh, came from them? Yeah, the one that really changed how I view solving this problem, ending factory farming, was Craig Watts. So Craig Watts was a chicken factory farmer, and I was introduced to him through a Reuters journalist. And the journalist had asked me to come and meet him in a coffee shop and look at some papers that were highly confidential. They were the feed tickets from a chicken farm going over many, many years. And I asked him, like, how in the world did you get these? Because it was like detailing the antibiotics that are put in the feed. And I expected him to say something like, oh, we put an undercover investigator in there or it got stole, we stole it or something, you know, something. And he said, no, the farmer gave it to me. And I was like, who in the world is this farmer? I've never heard of such a thing. I had been trying for years to actually get in on a chicken farm legally and openly. And no one would let me in, of course, because that you know, all sits behind closed doors. And this journalist introduced me to Craig and I drove out to meet him. And I have to say, driving out there, I was incredibly nervous. I was very convinced this was some kind of trick, an ambush of some kind. And upon meeting him, though, I ended up sitting in his living room floor for hours and hours listening to his story. I was shocked at how upset he was with the industry for different reasons than me. But he was also equally, had the equal kind of fury in his bones about how he was treated, about how he felt as trapped as the chickens. And so we ended up collaborating together. He let me openly film inside of those houses. And that ended up being a really big story. That was the first story I ended up working on with Nicholas Kristoff. And that in turn led eventually to the second big relationship, which was Jim Perdue which was a whole other ball game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. T- tell us about that one as well. Uh, for those who don't know, uh, Jim Perdue is the CEO of Perdue Farms, uh, one of the largest poultry farming and meat processing companies in the United States. Okay. Back to the interview. Yeah. So Jim Perdue, after literally depicting him as the villain in the video that Craig and I did together, you know, we essentially said that he was a liar. Like we show him saying like, farmers are happy. Chickens are happy. There's a lot of space. They're clean. And then we show the reality. And that ended up being the, the center of the campaign and the headlines in the New York Times. Well, fast forward a couple years later, and first Purdue wouldn't speak to me for a good year. They wouldn't answer my calls. But eventually, I happened to see an article, again, in the New York Times with a different journalist, of Jim Purdue. It was about antibiotics, but at the very end, he's quoted saying, we need happier birds, which was shocking. Like the word happy and admitting that they needed to be happier was shocking. 
And I ended up writing to their media person and saying, look, I really think we need to talk. I think we're closer than we think. Next thing I know, I'm being invited to tour the farms. I didn't even know Jim Perdue was going to be there. I came down from the hotel and there he is sitting in the lobby. And he, you know, was very friendly and we ended up forging a relationship where I'm able to speak frankly with him even today. Why do you think they were, they were open to talking with you and uh, I guess, yeah, talking with you in some detail, not just as kind of a PR exercise? Yeah, well, if you talk to one of the executives, Mark McKay, who is now the president of their premium foods, he actually refers to Mercy for Animals video, undercover video, as one of the reasons, and Compassion World Farming's videos, and saying, we looked at that video, and he said he turned around the room and said, do we agree with what we're seeing here? And no one did. And he said, did anybody actually just call them? No one had. So... I think quite often, you know, I think it does come down to individuals being willing to take that risk and put themselves in an uncomfortable situation and have a conversation. That's part of it. I also think their brand was suffering. And I think that they put themselves out there as a premium protein brand, a brand of quality. And for me, I look for companies like that as targets, honestly, because their brand relies on that, you know, and and, and there's a there's a there's a conflict there with their brand and what the the reality is on the ground. Yeah, and what was the reason that the the farmer I can't recall his name that he was willing to work uh, work with you? Yeah, Craig Watts says that he was simply fed up, and he saw the same commercial I had seen with Jim Perdue saying, you know, everything's wonderful, and he said the consumers are being hoodwinked, and I just can't live with myself anymore. It was shame. It's a kind of shame that he felt for the lies that were being fed to the American public and the consumers at large. And I think he was also close to the end of his debt, so he felt he could take more risk. Uh, He was a unique person, but he was willing to put himself at risk, but it was less financial risk than previous years. From the book, I had something of the impression that he was extremely angry. Was it it Tyson or or Purdue who he was working with? uh? Purdue. Yeah, that he was extremely frustrated with the with the company because I guess he was being paid very little and constantly new demands were being placed on him. The prices were very low. There was like no sympathy from from the company that he was contracting with. And it seemed like by the point he was talking to you, he was uh, he didn't really care whether he stayed in the industry or not, because it was so, so poorly remunerated and so, such unpleasant work that he was, I guess, yeah, willing, willing to willing to have a go at Purdue to some extent, almost it sounded kind of like revenge or as like a matter of justice for him. Yeah, I would say sort of. And to familiarize folks with what the poultry industry is like for farmers. So to give Craig's story, when he was 22 years old, he wanted to stay on this land in the poorest county in North Carolina. The tobacco industry had already fallen through and there were no other job options. So when the poultry industry came to town and said, you can raise chickens for us, just sign on this dotted line. All you have to do and this is what he did is you take a loan out and you build some chicken houses for a quarter of a million dollars. And then you use the money that you're getting from raising chickens to pay off that loan like a mortgage. So it seemed like a dream come true for Craig, who wanted to stay on the land. And a lot of farmers just want to have this life. For Craig, the land had been passed down five generations in his family. And he went to raise his family there. And it went great at first. But after a little while, it's a factory farm. So chickens die and you don't get paid for dead chickens. And so he started to fall into more and more and more debt. Just as he's about to pay off his debt, the company asks him to take another $100,000 out to do upgrades. And he's back in the the debt treadmill of chicken farming. And actually 45% of US poultry farmers incur a loss annually. So they're, they're, they're living like this all the time. In fact, the chicken operators, chicken farmers, in total have $5.2 billion worth of debt. And the majority of them are the the medium net income for poultry farmers is about $17,000. And it's a debt treadmill for chicken farmers. So, you know, I think that Craig wasn't just doing it, you know, out of revenge, but also because of the justice side of things. In the meantime, this is America's most popular meat. It's the most popular source of protein. And the chicken industry is making record profits. 
all on the backs of farmers and of course the animals that are suffering. It's not known to people that this, they think it's a family farm that's raising the chickens and it's not, they're essentially indentured servants. So yeah, in the, in the book, there's a, there's a couple of other similar-ish cases where you uh, formed positive relationships with, with, with people in the industry in order to, to, to get various reforms through. Did you find it challenging personally to work with people whose work, you know, you thought for many years is, is extremely harmful? Indeed, I guess I, I would use the word evil. Uh, <laughs> whenever I think about this issue, I, you know, think of people like, but you're the CEO of this, of this chicken company and think these people must be monsters. I, I, I think I would find it very hard to have a civil conversation on, on, on some level, but uh, you've like seen the farms that they're operating and yet are able to <laughs> connect with them personally. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure that I could do it. Yeah, I, I know. I listened to your um, podcast with Lewis Ballard and you said something like that, something around the lines of like, I don't have much empathy for, for these people, I, I noted. And I think that I very much felt that way until I met somebody. It's very easy to hate people you haven't met. And for me, I've always been very curious about getting to the root of a problem. And the only way you do that is through curiosity questions and exploration. And so I have learned so much sitting down with the poultry industry and the executives because the chicken industry itself is, is very unknown to even advocates who spend their entire lives working on it. And in order to unpick it and take the bricks out of that wall, we have to sit down to understand it. So at the very worst, I'm going to find out something I didn't know. At the very best, I might create a potential ally that I didn't have before and realize we're aligned on 80%. And I did find that in, in many cases. In, in trying to build concern for, for animals, I, I guess among farmers who are, I suppose, are probably more conservative than a lot of the people who you, who you work with. What kind of values are you, are you trying to, to draw in or to build support among people who, I guess, politically, are, you probably don't see eye to eye with? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the strong, one of the strongest is around tradition. And where I said Craig Watts wanted to raise his family here. And for five generations, his family had raised their family here. And that's what I'm saying, like getting to the root of the problem the reason Craig Watts chose chicken factory farming is not because he wanted to wake up every day and torture animals. It was the root, the reason, the rationale was because he wanted to stay on the land. He wanted to live in rural America and he wanted to have this traditional way of life that his you know, ancestors had had. So leaning into that and finding that that's the reason and what other solutions can we provide so that they don't choose chicken farming in the first place is a really important value to understand. And that goes with strong family. That's another strong value when I work with these folks. And then freedom. I hear it all the time from farmers who are angry is that they don't have economic freedom. They're trapped. They're treated like indentured servants. They believe that American freedom and economic freedom are these important, and these are typical conservative values, right? Like tradition, strong value, American freedom, economic freedom. These are traditional conservative values that we find in rural America. And so they're really aligned with moving away from factory farming, actually, and giving more autonomy to the family farmer so that they're not under the thumb of a big corporate integrator who is dictating what and how and how much they're going to be paid. Are the conditions for farmers in part especially bad because these large corporations have a lot of market power, that there's not a lot of competition where a farmer could like easily switch between the person who they're selling their chicken to and thereby get a higher price or more favorable conditions? 100%. Okay. Most yeah. of these farmers have no other options in their areas and that's intentionally done. So the way it's set up is first a company will set up a slaughterhouse. They call it a processing plant, but it's a slaughterhouse. And that, that costs a lot of money, right? Then they will contract farmers within a 30 to you know 50 mile radius of that slaughterhouse. They'll contract 200 farmers. And those farmers will all send their chickens to the slaughterhouse. Now you're not gonna have two slaughterhouses set up in the same radius, right? They're going to be set up somewhere else so they can get farmers from that area. And so should you not be happy with your integrator, with your processing plant, you'd have to move to get to another one. And as I said, a lot of folks have been living on this land for multi-generations and want to stay here. And, you know, mobility is not, not an option. So options are very few. Plus, any other kind of job is, is not possible. A lot of these places are, are suffering from a lot of economic turmoil and lack of opportunity. 
Yeah, okay. That makes a bit more sense of the fact that these companies seemingly just able to like wring every penny out of these out of these families. Uh, so, so this is like very little competition. And I guess there's also barriers to exit because people feel like they have they don't maybe have many transferable skills, so they're not sure what else they would do if they stepped into the unloan and left that. And, and they don't want to in any case. They want to continue with the kind of life that they've uh, they've had in the in the place that they've been living, which I guess leaves them just like sitting ducks, I suppose, for these uh for these companies. And maybe that's like that, that's what they've noticed. They're like these people want to stay here. They'll stay there even if the salaries are absolute pittance. So maybe we should just turn the screws on them. Yeah, I think that's right. And that's why I think a lot of where we've come up with a solution is around transformation, which is a project to transition farmers out of factory farming and into something else and really trying to develop an alternative economic option through hemp or mushrooms or anything else which we can repurpose and future-proof farmers as well because they're going to need to provide for a future, future economy, the future economy as well. So we do need to think about providing another option. Yeah. So one of the reasons I might have you know, had a negative opinion about these farmers is I think, why don't they just take their land and grow plants on it? Like, is the money so much worse? Is it that the land is unsuitable for growing plants? And so they feel like they have to do chickens and there's no alternative? What's, what's, what's the story there? Well, when I talk to farmers, I equate it to almost like gambling. Like they are presented with a contract that looks too good to be true. Well, it is too good to be true, but they buy into it because they're told it's a no brainer. You're going to make money. It's going to be easy. You can do something else while you're also watching chickens. It's not like crop farming. Crop farming is hard work. It's weather dependent. You might get a freeze. You might get a problem, a pest, whatever. And chicken farming is presented like chickens are robots and they're just, they're just machines that will turn out a profit for you. And you know, part of our job is to educate not just consumers, but farmers to say, this is a horrible job that will leave you in debt and miserable and try to stop farmers from signing up to it in the first place because they've been duped. And we ignored as advocates this part of it for so long. And you know, we didn't think that this was something we should tackle, but it, it quite clearly is. Yeah, just for listeners who, who aren't familiar with the story, and I guess I wasn't until I, until I read your book. Basically, uh, the companies have figured out this quite clever way of playing farmers where they get them to sign very long-term contracts with these loans. It looks really good on its face. I guess the same way that when you go and sign a long-term contract with a, with a cable company or with a mobile phone company, it's like made to look very, very nice and shiny. But then kind of the, the, the negative terms and conditions and all of the problems with it become apparent over time. But by then you're kind of locked into the thing and, and it's very hard to, hard to get out of it. Sorry, not to interrupt, but it's not a, co- they don't sign a long-term contract with the, with the company. I see. Okay. It's actually a loan with the bank. So they only get a contract for 90 days with, it's even worse because the money coming to them is only up to 90 days, but the money they owe can take 30 years. So they, they have to build all the infrastructure to raise the chickens in and they get a million dollar loan out. So this like, perhaps high school educated farmer who lives in the poorest county of rural North Carolina can get a million dollar loan out from the bank. I couldn't do that. And the only way to pay that debt off to the bank and the bank gives them that money based on this, this contract that they've got with Purdue or Tyson, any chicken company. And the only way to pay that debt off like a mortgage is to keep raising chickens. And if the company is unhappy with you, if you complain or if you do anything to upset them, they can cut your contract off within 90 days. And then you're stuck with this mortgage and no way to pay it. So that's how they keep you under the thumb because you're not going to, it's very hard for people to speak out because they risk everything. They risk their everything, all the entire loan is tied to their land and their home and everything. So if they don't keep raising chickens, they still have that debt and they would lose everything if they can't pay it off. Yeah. So as, as far as I can tell, the basic situation these people are in is that they're bearing all the risk for things not working out. So the company that they're selling to has pushed all of the risk onto them individually as a single farm. They're earning minimum wage kind of on average, but like with but very variable less than. Yeah. And the job is to go around and basically kill diseased chickens in your farm every day. And obviously the shed is a very unpleasant place to be. Like the key actual piece of work on a day-to-day basis is killing off the birds that are diseased or are not going to not going to otherwise make it. It doesn't sound like a fantastic life, and it seems like really like a lot of farmers should be leaving this if if it can't be reformed. But yeah, there's, there's barriers to doing that. 
I haven't talked about this very much because I feel it's a bit ironic talking about chicken farmers not being paid enough because I feel like maybe the, the optimal income might be zero dollars because <laughs> cause then the industry would, 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 would cease to be. But I guess the, the important lesson here is that if you've got another group that's disgruntled with the system for a different reason, then they are potential allies in, in changing in all kinds of ways. And you can, you can potentially collaborate even if you don't agree on exactly what the, what the problems are. Analyzing the, the process that, you, that you've been through, what do you think other people focused on social reform should kind of take away from the experiences that, that, that you document in Grub? Yeah, that's a great question. The first one is that we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and that only talking to people who agree with us won't get us to the solution. So recognizing that the opponent quite often has the power to solve the problem and that I don't. So for example, I don't care for a single chicken. The farmer does and Purdue does. So in order to understand how to unpick this problem and end it, I have to speak to the people who are in control of it. So uncomfortable being uncomfortable. Another one is the simple thing of being willing to sit down and recognize that the person across from you is a human being and has come to the decisions they've made out of a complex you know, human mind. And they will have, have made decisions that you will not be aware of. And sitting down with them and making that connection is really important. And this is something that comes through a lot of negotiation. If you work on business negotiation, it's the same thing. Like, you know, find the common football team that you both like or baseball team that you both like. Make those common connections. Maybe you have a a value or you, in in my case, I sat down with one particular chicken executive and both of us had adopted children. And so we were able to connect and forget that we were supposed to be enemies in that moment and talk about that experience and some walls came down and some trust was built because I recognized he was a human being and made that connection. And the last thing is to look for win-wins and start there rather than start with what you you disagree with. So in the case of Craig Watts, I started to think about how can I find him a different job rather than how do I just end his job? You know, like you were saying, how do I just give him zero dollars? Well, no, how do I look for the where place, it'll be faster and more efficient if we can find solutions where everybody wins because they'll be more willing to come with us. We won't have to spend resources fighting them. Instead, they'll just willingly come. So how can we find solutions where there, everybody is winning? It's not always possible, but you should look there first. So those are three. Yeah, on the, on the first one about building relationships with people, as I was reading the book, I was thinking there's different interpretations you could have of events. One would be that the personal connections that you built, you know, finding that you had both adopted uh, children, that you, you know, backed for the same football team or, or whatever, that those personal connections were able to move the needle and to, and to build trust and potentially get movement on a bunch of policy areas where otherwise it wouldn't happen, which is entirely possible. An alternative interpretation might be that because these companies were scared of mercy for animals, because they were scared mm-hmm. of the damage that they might suffer, and perhaps, you know, looking again at the numbers, they were like, actually making some of these reforms won't be as costly as we'll think, and we're probably going to be forced to do it anyway. So maybe let's just get ahead. It's actually like a perfectly fine business decision. Those business considerations made possible the relationship. And so where previously they were unwilling to talk to you because they decided to change anyway, now they wanted to build a more collaborative relationship. I guess it, it could be quite difficult to distinguish these two cases. And to some extent, they kind of blur together. But uh, what do you make of that? I think both, like I said earlier, recognizing that there's a PR risk of continuing to abuse animals and knowing that that is out there. And if your brand especially is tied to quality or caring or being better than others, then you're at risk. And so I always present to companies, animal welfare can be a risk or a benefit for you. You do it badly, that's a huge risk because here comes an undercover investigator to show what's going on. Or it can be a benefit if you do it well and you're leapfrogging ahead of your competitors. Consumers are only caring more and more about this issue, not less. And they're able to access more and more information and we're able to get more and more footage. I also think, you know, I had a capacity to make personal relations and a curiosity, a kind of, I don't know, almost like I could never satisfy my curiosity. I always liked understanding other people's perspectives and I was always curious about how people came to different conclusions than me. And so I think that did help too, to explore that and and make me more willing to be uncomfortable talking to others. There's some other organizations in the the animal space, I guess the Humane League jumps to mind, that that take a somewhat more adversarial approach and uh, might be less inclined to form relationships like the ones that that you've done. I suppose 
I recall the story that there was a, you were talking to someone, I think they were in charge of communications or some other aspect of a, of a chicken company. And they were saying, you know, I, I would love to make these changes for animals that you're suggesting, but the public doesn't care enough as yet. So you need to go out there and make a big fuss so that the most profitable thing for us to do is to adopt the reforms. And then I'll be able to push it through uh, within mm-hmm. the company, but because it will be a good business decision which I guess kind of blows the line between it's like, is that an adversarial relationship now? Or is that a, is that a collaborative one? I guess it's a, it's a little bit of both. What, what is kind of the, the right mix do you think of these adversarial approaches where you kind of do use the stick and other times when you, uh, when, when you use the carrot, and I guess, how, how can we know how to strike the right balance as a movement as a whole? Uh, the short answer is you need both, but we always start with a cooperative effort because it's more efficient. It's less resources. You know, if you can sit down with someone and get them to do what you feel is the correct pathway, that's going to cost less time and money. So you should always ask first. You should always sit down and say, what's, what are the barriers? Is there anything I can do about those barriers? Are there any, what's the resistance? Is there anything I can do about that? But like Costco example, we sat down with them for a year and was very clear. They just didn't care. It didn't matter. And the only thing that was going to work, and this should be a last resort, should be public campaigning because it is so costly. And that was the resort we had to we had to move to. That was the move we had to take because it was clear nothing else was going to work except really thinking through exposing them publicly for the realities on their farm that they were benefiting from economically. So it has to be both, but I always start with cooperative because it costs less, it's more efficient, and it moves us along faster. That makes sense. So I guess the bottom line is, yeah, you reach out the hand, try to form a cooperative relationship. If that doesn't work, then you have to be adversarial. But then as soon as they're willing to deal with you, then you want to switch to that because this is going to be so much cheaper and so much faster. 100%. Yeah. What are the other kind of profit or invest related pressures that are causing food companies that produce meat to look into increasing their, their non-meat offerings or diversify the kind of protein that they're providing? You know, one of the big things is the younger generation wanting a different product. And there's really clear signals from marketing companies that we, we purchase marketing reports. And it's very, very clear that younger populations want less meat. They want alternatives. They're, they're willing to try them and they're interested, you know, in that. I think the other driver, which is quite interesting is the cost of animal welfare improvements. So As we drive animal welfare into society as an important moral value in our purchasing and then drive that into the supply chain, it costs more. Cage-free eggs cost more. Treating animals costs more. And that, in turn, makes the products cost more. So companies are considering ways to keep costs similar and finding it difficult to do so. And we have a concrete example in Mexico, for example, where we're working with a very large bread company who committed to cage-free eggs and then is finding it challenging to keep price point where it is and is now turning to to us to say, could we consider plant-based, you know, products as an alternative, for example. So I think those sorts of pressures are causing food companies to really think about the future and what their offerings should look like. Price point will all is very much a driver, and that's why you see more plant-based products being offered as animal welfare improvements are made. And that's part of our theory of change, frankly, is driving up animal costs till they meet plant-based product alternative price points. And then also young people just demanding it more and wanting it more. So the idea is that, of course, we're trying to drive down the price of meat alternatives, but if the meat's a bit more expensive because the, the minimum standards are higher, then that's, that's going to happen sooner. And you'll like create the crossover earlier. Yeah, I mean, that's one of our main theories of change is that if you if you look at like, you know, we have a in, internal chart where we're looking at the price point of meat and then the price point of plant based and plant based is quite high right now and meat is quite low. And what we're trying to do is drive up the cost of meat, dairy and eggs through animal welfare improvements because all of those pr- costs have been externalized and we're trying to internalize those costs and make them cost what they should rather than making taxpayers pay for cleanup or health costs. And then as we do that, you know, the technology, the biotech industry related to plant-based gets better and more efficient. There's more of it, mass production, and that price point goes down. And at some point they cross, those lines cross. And we see that's where we expect a tipping point to happen, where the price of plant-based goes below meat and meat goes over and people purchase plant-based products. Price point is the main driver for purchasing. 
And that's why we're trying in many ways, not only does it re obviously morally reduce the suffering of the animals, but it, this is internalizing the costs of meat, dairy, and eggs will drive the price point up and make plant-based offerings more realistic for consumers. Yeah, in my, in my conversation with Lewis, I guess he was a little bit nervous about how cheap it's realistic to get some of these plant-based alternatives. So it could be that in some of these cases, driving up the, the cost of meat and eggs not only brings forward the date, but it might like actually make it possible where otherwise it might just be extremely difficult. Because he was pointing out that one reason that the way that we raise chickens is so cruel is that a kind of every efficiency has been wrung out of the system. There's very little slack there. And that means that broiler chicken meat is extremely cheap. And in fact, it's not trivial to figure out a way of making plant protein delicious at a price that's lower than that. So one other argument would be that it's like more strictly necessary to drive up the price of, 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 of meat and eggs in order to make it, make it happen. I think it will only be beneficial to drive up the, the price point for meat, dairy, and eggs. And it's beneficial to the animals. It's going to be beneficial to closing the gap between plant-based proteins and animal proteins. Yeah. One line of argument that is made in the book is that in general, the meat industry, the animal agriculture industry, is contributing to a whole lot of negative externalities. And it's producing, I guess, a lot of disgruntled people uh, nearby. So there's people who are frustrated about the treatment of animals. There's people who are very frustrated about the treatment of farmers. The farmers themselves are often very disgruntled. There's people who are concerned about all the many different like environmental effects. There's people who are, who are nervous about the antibiotic resistance. And although we don't know exactly how that's going to play out, the fact that you're causing all of these harms and creating all of these adversaries, in a sense, all these people who would like to, to force you to change is a business risk. And even if you don't know exactly like what policy reforms are going to, going to result, that exposes you to the industry potentially turning over and there being negative, negative risks to you in the future, negative outcomes. Is there any way of kind of quantifying the magnitude of that effect and how much that should affect investor behavior? Yeah, I, I know that there are organizations trying to do that. So FAIR is trying to do that, where they're trying to calculate the, the cost of some of these things, both antibiotics and on environmental pollution, and putting that to investors and explaining what a huge risk this is as an investment. And I think it's a really valid strategy and really support looking at this as a bad investment. This is just a poor investment if you just look at the bottom line. And it's about investment, you think, because there's all these risks that are generated by the fact that we might see policy reforms that drive up the cost a whole lot and kind of leave these assets stranded financially, in a sense. Yeah, a couple of things. I think, first of all, there's just the brand risk that this is always going to be a risk that's out there for the companies in terms of being exposed. You know, tofu doesn't have that kind of risk. And then there's the risk of policy changes that ban a practice that then mean that the company will have to invest in upgrades or changes like new cages or, you know, no cages or, and then the environmental ones and the health ones that goes on and on, the antibiotic changes. There's just so many factors that are hard to account for the total cost, but there are huge risks for investors. In the book, you talk quite a bit about the health and environmental concerns around food production, as well as the animal welfare concerns. And it seems like the impression you give is that this kind of complementarity around solving all of these all of these problems at, at once. But one thing that struck me as I was reading the book is that there might be kind of more intention than it initially appears. So if you can get people to just stop eating meat, then you solve all of these problems kind of at once. So that's really nice. And as much as you're trying to reform farming, if you insist on, say, changes that make farming more environmentally friendly, that tends to drive up costs for consumers in many cases. And then if people are already paying more for the environmental benefit, are they also going to be willing? Do they feel like they have money in their grocery budget to also pay for the added cost of higher welfare, welfare animals? So I guess I slightly worry that by pushing on all these things at once, it's possible that solving one uh, problem kind of cannibalizes potentially others. Yeah. So I think that, you know, the ultimate goal, our theory of change and its natural conclusion is you internalize all of these externalities for meat, dairy and eggs to make it more expensive. And the idea that we just keep doing that and keep doing that and keep doing that, and simultaneously, we're reducing the cost of plant-based alternatives, cell-based meat, until they go below the price point of meat, dairy, and eggs. The majority of people don't care. They just want their protein. They're not really thinking about it. And they'll switch to a cheaper alternative as soon as it's available. So we focus on animal welfare, yes, because it reduces the suffering of animals in the system, but also because we want to pressure towards a tipping point where plant alternatives replace meat entirely. 
Yeah. Okay. Now I'm seeing it. I, I didn't get this as I was reading the book. So I suppose animal welfare reforms that improve welfare animals and drive up the cost are a double win because you get the win immediately from the animal welfare, 100%. but also the, the, the higher price. But if you can drive up the price by, say, raising salaries for farmers or by getting them to treat the environment better, then that's great as well because you've just increased the price and thereby reduced demand for meat relative to, to other options. Exactly. So a lot of people when they saw, you know, I'm an ethical vegan and a lot of people when they see me advocating for farmers go, what the heck are you doing? Like this person kills chickens. And that is my exact argument. If they get paid more, chicken costs more. That's good. If the environmental costs get internalized, that's good. If antibiotics reduction means, you know, all these things, they're all any internalizing of the cost drives up price. And that is good because consumer demand goes down as price goes up. That's so interesting. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd thought of this thing, well, shouldn't they be paid zero dollars because then they won't produce it. But I suppose the opposite extreme is also true. If they were each paid a million dollars, then <laughs> the industry would also disappear. So right. we're going to have to get away from the, I guess, we're probably currently somewhere near the sweet spot that maximizes production. And we need to like push in either direction. It's kind of good. Yeah, totally. Do you worry about this? Uh, I mean, you talk about this in the book, that whenever people raise health and environmental concerns, it tends to cause people to eat less beef and, and more chicken and more fish. But yeah, do you worry about like highlighting those concerns to you know a, a wider audience that might be reading a book? Yeah, I think it's a big concern of mine. And we've seen companies as they adopt emissions targets, for example, the first thing they go for is reducing beef or dairy in their supply chains. And then the number of animals actually goes up, fish and chickens. And you see that for health reasons as well, where people have a heart attack and they're told to stay off of the red meat and then they're eating more chickens and fish. And those are more individual animals because one cow equals 26 chickens, for example. So it's a huge concern and one where we have to pay close, close attention to how we're driving the consumer in terms of health. I don't think health is a, a super reason to use as an advocating reason. I think that the human angle, the human justice angle seems to be a better approach. It's interesting. I guess I hadn't quite picked up that the theory of change primarily runs through price increases. And I guess in, in uh, Mercy for Animals kind of messaging and uh, it's talking about its success, it talks a lot about kind of how many animals will help to live in better conditions, which is, of course, going to be correlated with these price increases. But I wonder whether there's any way of measuring the outputs in terms of like actual, you know, this is how many chickens were sold for this much more money. That might sound a little bit more adversarial. <laughs> so perhaps that, is, perhaps that isn't a better way of framing it to the public. But. Yeah, it's been tricky. And for a long time, you know, this is a, a kind of newer theory of change. But, you know, I've, I'm entering my third decade of animal advocacy, right? And we used to try to pretend it wouldn't drive up costs because we were afraid the industry wouldn't engage with us. We'd say, oh, it's not going to cost more, we can make it work. And probably about, I don't know, less than 10 years ago, I switched and said, no, it's going to drive up costs. And it should, because we have squeezed out every you know, possible efficiency out of these animals. And that is not okay. And all of the risk and all of the costs have been put on the animals and the farmers and the industry should pay more. They just should. They make a lot of money. They're benefiting from subsidies. They're benefiting from tax breaks. They should pay more. And that's something we need to be loud and proud when we speak in our messaging, because it also then drives up price and it means the consumption goes down. So I am speaking much more vocally about this point because I don't think chicken should be that cheap. It shouldn't be something that we eat every day. It, sh it used to not be, and it is today, and that's core to the problem. Yeah. So now that I get this theory of change, I have to have to rewrite some of my questions on the fly here. I was going to say <laughs> there's something <laughs> there's something slightly funny about the fact that in the book it seems to be kind of a split uh, among um, among animal focused people between those who think that moral suasion is the thing that's going to make the make the difference and those who think that technology like plant based meat alternatives, clean meat, is going to make the difference. I guess you're doing the synthesis where you're saying moral suasion will raise the price and then that will speed up the pace at which we'll switch to, to plant based food. I suppose then the reframing of the question might be. Is it more efficient to focus or to, to try to raise the price of, of meat? Or is it more efficient to put that money, those people, into trying to lower the price of plant-based alternatives? I guess that's a very hard question to answer. But do you, do you have any uh, kind of bottle in your head or has anyone kind of looked at that comparison? Yeah, we actually did a, a paper called Moving the Needle. And we talked about the synergy of these two areas needing to work together. Because if you think about plant-based products and their success, I cannot think of another product in the market that has a free marketing wing like they have. So companies like the Impossible Burger or Beyond, Mercy for Animals is essentially trashing their competitors. They are creating a very big demand 
for free. So there's a synergy in which we are the marketing arm for these companies. And we're creating this huge demand by exposing the realities of their competitors, by building a very aligned and passionate following for their products. And I cannot think of another positive example like that in the market. I can think of negative where like soda, for example, had NGOs advocating against sugar and schools and sodas and schools. And that was successful policy wise. Flip that. We're, I cannot think of another example where there is a, a marketing product that is being cheerleaded by a nonprofit passionate advocacy base that wants it to be successful. Possibly, I guess, climate uh, advocates and solar panels or Tesla totally. cars and that kind of thing. Yes, yeah, that's a idea. great, totally great example. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I guess one benefit of kind of the food R&D or the, you know, plant-based meat, clean meat R&D is that any advances that you get probably will eventually spread through the industry and then ideally through what becomes a global industry because it's kind of knowledge that just can spread everywhere. It's a, potentially a little bit more challenging trying to raise the price of meat through getting, say, policy reforms or changes to standards because they tend to be like within a specific jurisdiction. So you run a campaign and then you probably get it in the United States specifically. That, that doesn't automatically kind of then increase the price in, in other countries. I, I guess potentially you get some cultural crossover, but it's a bit less of a like global thing all at once. Yeah, that's, that is true. But what we have seen is that certain countries are globally inter- influential in terms of setting standards. And so Europe really has led the way in terms of animal welfare reform. And even now they're leading the way in, in many ways on the policy side of plant-based and clean meat. Yeah, so I think one of the, the big factors is that certain countries are globally influential in setting market trends. And Europe and the EU when it comes to animal products are those countries. And so I, I do think that that will impact other countries and we we have seen that happen. So even when China tries to trade with the EU and I, I used to work on pig slaughterhouses and like looking at pig slaughterhouses in China. And one of their key questions was, what are the standards required to trade into the EU? In the EU, if they set standards on, you know, there has to be these sorts of health standards, these sorts of animal welfare standards that have to be followed, then you can trade with us. That can really raise the bar in other countries. So these countries have the capacity to raise the bar and the standards on other countries. Just another comment would be, uh, we might think that, you know, if people can do kind of breakthrough research, breakthrough R&D into, you know, creating really tasty, much, much cheaper plant-based alternatives, that that really, that those might be the most valuable jobs. But we can't actually send 100,000 people into those jobs. Uh, they don't exist. And a lot of people don't, don't have the necessary skills. So then there's like, there's other things like, I suppose, the marketing for those organizations. And then there's also just people who are driving up demand by, by all kinds of different means. I suppose I, I'm, I'm somewhat inclined to think that, yeah, people who can go into the food science stuff, that might well have the biggest impact in the, in the long term. But no, <laughs> most people don't have food science degrees. So. Yeah, I think there's a huge need for R&D in plant-based and cell meat as well. I think we received like a fraction. I don't, I'm, you know, you'd have to talk to Bruce Friedrich. I'm sure, you know, you can look back at that, but about the amount of money that goes to that kind of technology. And currently the movement itself is trying to free up more and more money from appropriations and other activities within the government to try to get more money into R&D to help develop this as a proper alternative. And I think that is one of the, the big factors to help move the needle. Moving back a little bit, it seems like one approach that you've taken advantage of is whenever you have an industry or an organization that has disgruntled employees, that is a fantastic opportunity. It's kind of, if you, <laughs> uh, if you speak to people who ever run an organization, kind of ex-disgruntled employees is kind of a nightmare scenario because they know lots of things, they, they know the pressure points that they can, they could potentially do you a lot of damage. And that's something that you've taken advantage of in this case where farmers are extremely unhappy with the industry and uh, you can use that. Can you think of any other cases perhaps where this approach might might be possible to to use that? Because possibly if oil uh, workers or oil and, and drill are workers were extremely frustrated, then that could potentially be a pressure point that you could you could apply to uh, fossil fuel companies. But I'm not sure whether there are other like uh, promising avenues. Well, I think even within big corporations, I think we tend to think of corporations as these monolithic beasts where everyone thinks the same thing and that they're all in line. But I found when I speak to companies, I always find that one vegan. You would be so shocked that in these meat companies, there's a vegan, there's a vegetarian. My wife or my husband is a vegan or vegetarian. So similarly, in any industry you work in, you're going to find the the sympathetic person. And that's the person you sit down with and go, what's the deal here? Where are the pressure points? 
what do I need to do? So that example you used earlier where this person said, look, I really get what you're saying on chickens, but it's not a priority in the company. So what you need to do is go externally and create a lot of noise. And that's what I did. And that worked. And her, her telling me that was the information I needed from the inside to be able to push the issue up in their priority list. A kind of classic debate that has gone on in the animal movement is whether it could be harmful to get incremental welfare improvements, incremental policy reforms that improve the well-being of animals. Because the fear is that then that could reduce momentum because people will be satisfied with with the point that you've gotten to. And so you'll never get a full abolition. And it's interesting that the approach that you're taking where you're like, well, full abolition is probably going to come anyway because of the meat alternatives, because of clean meat, because of the, the plant-based alternatives. On that model where you don't need the full moral suasion in order to abolish factory farming or potentially to abolish animal agriculture in general, the wind is kind of taken out of the sails of that argument. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I, I, I do think that's right. And the idea is that there's a tipping point that occurs. And so it doesn't rely on that total moral persuasion to happen. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's move on and chat about the uh, organization that you're a leader of, which is Mercy for Animals. Yeah, MFA operates in over six countries and now has a budget of over $14 million. I guess to, to catch the audience up who isn't super familiar, what are Mercy for Animals' uh, central programs, other than, I guess, the, the ones that we've already talked about? Yeah, I frame them as interventions. So we have five main interventions. One is changing institutions. So there are institutions and systems that hold factory farming in place, and we have to unravel those in order to stand up against the status quo of our current food system. So those are both corporate and legislative policies that we try to secure. The second is engaging the public. So I think we have to increase public awareness and sympathy toward our mission. While not everyone wants to be on the front lines, we want to build awareness and support to decrease resistance to the work we're doing. So that could be documentaries and media, social media recipes, getting people enthusiastic. And, and the key thing is decrease resistance, create an environment in which we can be more successful, a landscape that's more successful. The third one is building people power. So that's different where you might have a million people you're trying to engage on public awareness. There's a smaller number, say 50,000, where you're trying to really deeply engage. That's the people power. So people drive this and we have to organize them and they have to help us bring about the change. So these are people who are willing to do more. They're donating, they're protesting, they're calling up the executives, they're organizing in their communities. The fourth one is a newer one, which is really the result of the book that I've written and that path I've been on, which is the creating the solution. So we can't just say what is wrong, but we have to build what is right. And this means rolling up our sleeves and working to build the system we think is correct, which could look like transitioning factory farms to plant-based farms. It could look like increasing plant-based options and creating favorable legislative landscapes. So like getting subsidies towards something else or taking away subsidies. And the fifth is building a thriving culture and a strong infrastructure. Like we continue to believe culture eats strategy for breakfast. If you don't have a good finance system, you're not going to be able to pay people and it's going to be a mess. You have to have a really strong organization in order to be successful. Yeah, I guess you've got to make difficult strategic decisions about how to allocate the budget between these different programs and which programs to run. And presumably you've thought about doing other things and then opted not to do them. In brief, kind of what, what's, the, what's the case in favor of you know, each of these programs offering a, offering a large bang for buck for Mercy for Animals and its donors? Yeah, well, the biggest and easiest one to understand is the intervention related to institutions. So if we were able to secure a policy with McDonald's on broilers, that's half a million chickens overnight, lives are improved. To reach half a million individuals would be very hard, expensive, labor intensive, and we would never be able to follow up with them. Even a, another level up from that is what if we created a policy for all chickens in the United States that is a law. That's 9 billion chickens with one piece of legislation that are impacted. So obviously the biggest bang for your buck is legislation followed by corporate policy. And corporate policy often is a necessary predecessor, at least in the United States, towards a legislative change. So you get a kind of critical mass of companies that will agree to do a particular action and then a policy and then legislation is easier. That's what we saw with Prop 12, where we banned cages 
for laying hens, well, we already had 200 companies that had agreed to ban cages for laying hens. So it made there very little resistance from the industry to adopting this in California for Prop 12. So that's probably the, the, you know, the most important intervention we have. But you know, what I've learned over time is if you have, as I said with that company example, if it is not important or in the media and is not driving kind of public and consumer opinion, then companies and lawmakers have no reason to care about it. So this really works in synergy with public awareness. If it is not on the agenda and being pushed as a priority and we're not pushing it as a priority within a company, something else will overtake it. So it really needs to work in synergy with raising and influencing public opinion on these matters. And a core group of that is the capacity building. So that's where we're taking the core group who are willing to go the extra mile. And it's not quite astroturfing, but those are the people who really are passionate or willing to make the calls and drive up to a corporate headquarters and protest and give money in another level. So I think those are the, you know, really the, the key components that I think are really important and are really cost effective in driving change. Yeah. It sounds like to some extent, these aren't separate interventions that you would naturally run independently. They're kind of all one integrated system. So you can't kind of consider each one in, in isolation because you need the activists in order to, you know, <laughs> create the pressure on the companies to do the reforms, which then like drives the policy thing. Absolutely. Like our, it's a cascading effect and they all work in synergy with each other in order to get to our mission and vision of the world we want for farmed animals. So they rely on each other. There's certainly things we don't do that don't work with our theory of change, but these are the things that I think work. I, and I will say it's very country dependent because different countries use different pieces of this. For example, in China, we are not going to be able to do heavy corporate campaigning, for example. We can't do any corporate campaigning and we have to work with the government. And what we've done with our managing directors is we're trying to give them, we say, these are the different interventions that Mercy for Animals believes works. You choose which one in your country is going to leverage and be useful. I would say public awareness works and is needed in Mexico, for example, and, and corporate policy is another one. And the same in, in Brazil, it's very similar. But you know, certain countries, some of these interventions will not work. And so it is country dependent and important to think in the framework, like every country has its own intervention that they're going to have to select from, depending on what's useful. Yeah. Is, is the public awareness stuff kind of key in Brazil and Mexico, mostly because you're at an earlier stage where the, that investigation hasn't been done and the public just isn't informed. So that's kind of the, the first step. And then you can start pushing on the, on the, on the later steps down the, the theory of change. Absolutely. And I think, for example, in Mexico, so Brazil is further along than Mexico. So in Mexico, over time, we've realized we actually have to go back and build more public awareness and more capacity building and, and more buy-in because our corporate relations work and our corporate campaigning is going slower than we thought it would. And part of it's because there just isn't awareness and we haven't influenced public opinion enough. And we really have to build public awareness to be able to push this higher on the priority list for government and companies. So I think that you have to assess each country carefully and you really need someone locally and sort of an expert to understand what are the right interventions, where's the right place to start. If you think of the United States and Europe, I mean, Europe, even further back, they've been working for decades on building public opinion around this. And, uh, you know, one of my kind of criticisms of the way we analyze progress in the United States and Europe is we often look too short of a period back. We think, oh, look at the last five years, we tried this corporate intervention, and it quickly turned around cage free egg policies. Well, that's not actually how it worked. There were decades of raising public awareness around farmed animals as being sentient beings that led to that moment, not just the last five years, but actually quite a lot of work. So when we enter new countries, we shouldn't expect to be able to use a cookie cutter model where we just take a corporate intervention program and plop it in Mexico and expect it to work. You have to actually do the work about raising public opinion on this and influencing public opinion in order to get to that point where you can then apply that strategy. Yeah, that, that's interesting that I suppose some of the some of the costs are hidden because they've uh, they're, they're, they're back in the past before this kind of last step that then produces the outcome. So I guess, yeah, that's an, it's an issue with a cost effectiveness analysis sometimes that uh, it's like potentially if, if you just look at like the, the last step, then things can look incredibly cost effective. But then once you consider the, the fuller picture, maybe it's a bit more expensive than it looks. Totally. And I, I think of it like a like a chess game, right? So it's as if you were to take the last like three, you know, <laughs> 
three moves of a chess match, like, and think that that was it. But actually there was an entire, you know, game that was played in a bunch of moves. And I always try to tell people, like, don't just think of the next chess move. Think of all of them that are going to lead us to the next. And likewise, like when we're analyzing a victory and thinking, how did we get it? Don't just think of the last three things we did. Think of way back. What are all the things that led to this moment? And how did, how can we replicate that? Yeah. I guess there's a degree of symmetry because there's, there's a bunch of costs that were incurred in the past that didn't bear fruit then, but, but are bearing fruit now. But at the same time, those past costs might uh, continue to deliver benefits in the years to come. Like all, all of that public support, all of that public concern might lead to further successes against uh, in corporate pledges in, in, in years to come. Yeah. And that makes me think about what are we doing now that we think is not successful like broilers is going quite slowly, frankly, like we, the improvement for the lives of broilers, we, you know, we haven't had success in every campaign yet. We've had a lot of companies, but not the big ones. And do we give up? Do we say it's not working? Forget it. We've chosen the wrong strategy. Or is this part of a longer term pathway that will build and build and build until we have the last three moves of the, of the chess match, you know, and it's really difficult to unpick that. But I, I tend to believe that the, in my experience that the the public awareness piece is quite important and builds for many years before you start to have progress. And so if we're starting with a new issue, so when I look ahead to fish, for example, which is kind of the next frontier for us to work on, how long are we going to have to work on building awareness and care and opinion around fish welfare before it is the right tractable moment to start working on corporate policy or legislative policy? Like when is the switch possible? And I've really been thinking a lot about where is the cost-effective moment to move from public awareness side of things to an actual campaign and corporate engagement and legislative policy change. Yeah, it's very interesting thinking that kind of all of the advocacy that's been done, all of the information sharing that's been done over the last few decades in the US around you know, how poorly animals are treated on farms has actually been extremely useful because I get, I've worried that it hasn't been that useful because if you look at what fraction of the population is continuing to eat meat, it seems like it's roughly flat. Like we haven't really managed to increase the number of vegans or vegetarians that much. But I suppose maybe what we're learning is that that theory of change hasn't really panned out. We haven't really been able to convince people to give up meat individually. But then it was building this support that then could be turned into a victory in a, in, via a different mechanism by getting the companies to change their, their policies and driving up the cost. Yeah, I think that is my conclusion. Is you know, I think that um, there's been a lot of studies on how people choose and they choose on price points. So as long as meat is cheap and cheaper than anything else, that's what people are going to choose. I don't think other factors play in as strongly. And of course, I can't taste fat, like the alternatives can't taste bad, they can't be inconvenient to, to acquire. But, you know, one of the main drivers is price. And we saw this actually, when the economic recession, I think it was 2012, I want to say something like that, or maybe 10, we were claiming victory, like it was a point at which meat consumption went down for the first time, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we got really excited. And I remember being at a conference at TAFA at HSUS and there being a speaker who I won't name and shame, but saying like, we're winning, you know, I think everybody was cheering. And you know what? It was related to economic recession. It was related to the fact that corn prices went up and chicken prices also, because chicken eat corn, went up and people had less money. And so that drove down the consumption. It had nothing to do with us. And then as soon as that ended, consumption went right back and above where it was. And so it was a lesson to us that price is, is probably the biggest you know, component driving purchasing. And as long as meat is as cheap as it is, then that's going to be a problem. But that actually is much more solvable than trying to convince people that chickens are worthy of our attention, actually. To me, that is a, it's a person who spent my entire life being very driven by the moral component and wanting to convince people that chickens are important, that they're sentient beings and convincing almost no one, practically speaking of that in the global scheme of things. It's easier for me to say, this is cheaper. And people go, okay, yeah, I'll buy it then. Yeah, it tastes yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a great solution. Um, I do think that the, the, the kind of, you know, the, the moral driver is important for me and for that base to drive this change and, and expose brands and create the risk and be that marketing wing. It's like it, in one of your previous podcasts, you said something about the Quakers, you know, it's like that kind of against slavery. It's like this, there has to be this core element driving the moral, never the diehards who have the grit, who are never going to give up. 
And that drives a market towards a change, I think, in a way that nothing else can. And that's a really critical component of what we're doing as part of this, this change. Yeah. Just on the point about how the 2008 recession created this illusion that, that meat, uh, meat reduction was going down because of uh, people's moral concern. There's basically a cottage industry every time there's a recession in journalists are spotting a social trend where, you know, I think one of the, there's a whole series of, of, of articles uh, back, in, back in 2009, 2010 about how like millennials aren't interested in buying houses anymore. Millennials like aren't inter- interested in driving cars, doing all these other things. And, uh, you know, as is usually the case, I mean, economists have learned to, to spot this every, uh, every time. It was because they didn't have jobs, because they didn't have so much money that they were not... <laughs> <laughs> that they were not buying these things, yeah. and then as so, as soon as the uh, as soon as the economy improved, and as soon as young people were, <laughs> were earning money again, then everything bounced back to normal, and all of those trends were just kind of an, an illusion. So I guess yeah, we, we should uh, keep that in mind when, when they're reading those pieces in future. Is there a metric that we have for seeing how the, the American public's like knowledge about the, the conditions of animals you know, on farms has changed over over decades? Whether they're like more informed now or, or more like concerned in a general sense, even if they're not acting on it, and you know when they when they go grocery shopping. They are more, I don't have those numbers at my fingertips, but I do know that concern is increasing and that there is high concern amongst purchasers. That doesn't always match their purchasing habits, though, which is why it's you know a concerning thing. But it's useful for leveraging brand risk or leveraging campaigns to say to companies, people will be outraged, at least momentarily, and they need to perceive that a company is doing something better, especially in a competitive market where they could choose something else. And so we leverage that competition between companies to advocate for change. Yeah, yeah. I was just curious about that, because I think I'm almost too young. I, most of my adult life, I think people have known or many people have suspected that the conditions of animals and farms is, are, are, are very bad. And they've kind of been looking away from it because the information has been out there. But presumably, there was a time, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, well, firstly, maybe the conditions weren't as bad then, but also the investigation hadn't been done and support hadn't been built and people hadn't yet realized in general that, that the treatment of animals was very poor. So it's kind of maybe interesting to look at that, that story of change over a long time as a whole. Yeah, I mean, that might be one of the driving factors for the marketing research that shows that younger folks are wanting to eat less meat. And, and that if you lend, you know, butterfly effect that out for a, a, somebody doing marketing research, they're going to go, the future shoppers are not going to want as much meat. So we need to pay attention to that younger generation who are going to be the future shoppers all the time. And so that, that could be a really big factor. Yeah. Are there any interventions that Mercy for Animals has considered uh, implementing or, or launching over the last few years that you ultimately decided not to go for? And was there an interesting reason for that? Well, I think over the years, we often get asked to do farm sanctuaries. Our staff sometimes want to do them and our donors want us to do them. Our donors do them, our donors give to them. And there's a, there's a drive for the direct help. And that is a good fundraiser. It is a good feeling. And as anyone, but as anyone who's worked in a a shelter or sanctuary will tell you, and I personally have rescued a chicken, the calls to rescue never stop. And the number of animals that need assistance never goes to zero. And so We just decided that that's not a path we're going to go down because it would expend too many resources on direct rescues and operational costs that you can never adjust. So, for example, during the the pandemic where, you know, we were very worried about our donations and what would happen, if you have a sanctuary, you still have to pay for that regardless. And while we have staff costs, yes, we can reduce travel, we can reduce spend, we can reduce all kinds of things and go to a minimum without doing harm and still you know, advocating from our desks. But if you have a sanctuary, you have an operational cost that never goes away and you're always having to say no. So I think that we didn't want to expend resources on that. And I think there's space in the movement for all kinds of different interventions. And you know, we really think about how can we use our resources, skills and influence to get the most out of that $14 million that we are to best help animals. And we landed on the interventions, focusing on institutional change, people power, awareness, and and showing what a good food system looks like based on that analysis. And we have a really deep analysis, data-based analysis that we do. You can look at our impact center online, which I shared with you. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways that organizations and individuals, I think, can contribute to this goal. And the most important thing is that we all do something, that we all get involved uh, and and hold on to that hope for change. Something that's a bit uncomfortable about farm sanctuaries, which are, for listeners who don't know, I I guess they're places where animals that used to be on farms are are cared for once, once they're not on farms. 
there's something a bit uncomfortable about it where, as far as I understand, many organizations that run them do it, as you said, because it's good for fundraising or it's good for attracting volunteers or it's kind of good PR, whereas other stakeholders are interested in them because they are, because they like them because they're directly good for the animals that are, that are in the sanctuaries. And then I guess you end up in this kind of double speak where it's performing quite a different role and people might feel a bit uncomfortable <laughs> about what, what role this is actually forming within the organization. Yeah, I mean, you you have to be careful of not monetizing the animals again, you know, for for the animals, which is a you know seems like a contradiction. Uh, most of the people I know involved in sanctuaries are really good-hearted, good intentions, and are working hard, harder than most in terms of it's never ending and it is an exhausting thing to do. And I know that a lot of my team members really find healing when they go to these farm sanctuaries, connecting with an individual animal. So I think it has a purpose and sort of emotional healing and seeing an actual happy animal, an actual free animal. And and that can have its kind of psychological purpose in and of itself. And that is very valuable. And we've been doing like just understanding what a free animal looks like and feels like and what they do and who they are can be very grounding. I just don't think there needs to be a ton of them. And it's not something that we're going to do because we're focused on institutional change. But I, I think it can be valid. What's an important weakness of Mercy for Animals that you'd like to see improved over the next couple of years? Oh, yeah. You know, I'm very reflective on our weaknesses. I think international expansion is a big one. I think we focus on the United States so much. I've actively said we're not going into Europe. Maybe in five years, I'll be eating my words. But we're not going to Europe, it's saturated. And I really want us to expand internationally and operate autonomously in regions and be able to make have them countries be able to make their own decisions based on their culture and what's effective in their countries. So as we move into Southeast Asia, where we're hoping to set up a Singapore office this year, I'm really trying to flip more resources over to Asia, where a fifth of the animals are. Southeast Asia, a fifth of the farmed animals are. And that's a big struggle. A big weakness is just trying to move money away from the U.S. Not away, but as the pie gets bigger, the portion of that pie is more in Asia or Brazil or other or Mexico in those countries. The other is rapid growth. Growing an organization is not easy. And we've seen a lot of animal protection groups over the past decade go from small groups of young, passionate, mostly volunteer activists to becoming professional organizations with multi-million dollar budgets. At MFA, we've seen a lot and learned a lot about how to grow sustainably and in a way that really invests in our teams who are our best assets and how to build a truly strong organization that can withstand the, the waves and the storms and still be you know, powerful and productive and efficient and all those things. Yeah. So the, the first weakness is just that Mercy for Animals is very concentrated in the United States. And I guess, ideally, if you were going from scratch and you could just allocate people and money freely, then uh, probably you would have split your resources uh, more between different countries and maybe, maybe not chosen the United States as the, as, as the key place to operate. I actually think we would still um, because of the global influence. So if you just take like Black Lives Matter, for example, and this is the example we've used recently, when Black Lives Matter happened in the United States, there were protests globally happening for this, this very important social justice outcry in Paris and, you know, Asia, everywhere in Brazil. And so you see the influence of certain countries. So I think we would still be in the United States. Yeah, that's interesting. I guess another thing is that the United States might be among the first countries that's a big market for plant-based alternatives to meat. And so this is a good place in order to to drive up demand and you know, increase the revenue of those companies. Yeah. And I think that um, when you we have this thing called the Farm Animal Opportunity Index, and it's based on effective altruist kind of concepts. And we heavily weigh tractability in this. And the United States is a place where tractability is high. And so you will be able to make more progress in a country like that. So there's a large number of animals. So we're the second largest, second to China on chicken production, you know, where there's a huge amount of suffering happening and we're a tractable country. So if you think of effective altruist principles, it's, it's ticking all of those boxes. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that index that you've designed to try to figure out where, I guess, Mercy for Animals and potentially other animal-focused organizations should aim to operate and expand. Yeah, can, can, you, can you explain how that, how that index works? Well, we'll stick up a link to it so, uh, so our listeners can go and take a, take a look if they're interested. Yeah, it's a really fun tool, and you can use it in whatever way is useful to you. And the Farm Animal Opportunity Index, it helps evaluate each country 
and considers the scale of the problem, tractability, and then their global influence. So global influence is not something normally considered in effective altruism, but we have considered that an important factor as we've been talking about here. And it's a, a tool that was developed by one of our agriculture economists on, on staff. And it has a bunch of factors that weigh up under each one of those scale of the problem, tractability, and global influence. And it then produces a number saying, this is how likely it is for you to be successful in this particular country. And we are making that available to the entire movement so that you can use it as you see fit. And what we've found, which I think is you know, worth mentioning, is that tractability for us became the, the thing we weighed highest in the process because we felt that if something isn't tractable, we can't, there's no point. We'd be wasting money, right? We'd be wasting time. We'd be wasting. So tractability became the, the thing we weighed the highest. And as we move through the index, we had, for example, this is what we're using now to decide how to move into Asia. So the Farm Animal Index led us to identify six countries to target for a scoping study where we're looking more deeply into the more qualitative factors. So that led us to Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, Korea, and Japan. So we have this like quantitative kind of thing, which is the Farm Animal Opportunity Index. And then we do, that helps us identify countries to look deeper into. And then we do a scoping study on the countries. This has been a year process, by the way. So the scoping study is designed to complement that data by adding this qualitative measure where we, for example, look at people's attitudes towards farmed animals and cultural context, governance, like views on health, views on market conditions, views on would they buy plant-based products? Do they think plant-based products are healthy? And then we interview consultants and the local movement, and then we decide to move ahead accordingly. And so this has led us to setting up an office in Singapore is our next step. And then consultants in these other six countries, that is our plan for this year. And I think that it's it's really fascinating to do it this way, to get this complex view of a country before you start. I would say if we went back to that question of like, what mistakes have we made? We used to just go into a country and be like, okay, start with the regular interventions and then see what fails, throw spaghetti at the wall. And when I started, I said, no, we're going to stop and we're going to really deeply look at these countries and understand what will work before we start. And then we hand over all this data to a managing director once we get started and he or she can then begin hopefully with better footing. Yeah. So you've got, I guess, something like, you know, uh, 20 metrics, which includes things like, you know, like corruption index, how easy it is, is it to start an organization? How easy is it to communicate with people? Is the government going to try to shut you down? Like <laughs> all, all these different metrics that kind of indicate how promising it might be to operate in a country. And as you mentioned, you, you've put in your weightings here. So you've got particular weightings for the for the scale factors, like how many animals are there? How much are they exporting? Particular weightings for tractability and, and influence and so on. But people can download it and like change it how, however they like, uh, if, they, if they disagree with those weightings and would rather focus on, on, on different factors. Yeah, how, how do you feel about using structured tools like that to make these strategic decisions versus a more holistic judgment? Do, do you worry that potentially think important things could be, could be missed in this, say, just because there isn't data about an important, an important factor? Yeah, that's why we had to do the qualitative too. We didn't feel the quantitative approach was enough. It led us down, it narrowed down the choices, but it did not give us the full picture. So for example, we couldn't really quantify things like the impact of influencers, you know, and there's certain factors that you can only get through qualitative research. And this kind of lends to the limitations, I think, of data-driven approaches sometimes and how you have, I think, complement them with qualitative approaches too and doing that deeper research. And, you know, I think that that is an important takeaway from and and kind of consideration is that everything cannot be told by data. The story cannot always be told by data. It can help us narrow down the approaches and think it through. But if you you then have to complement that with the qualitative research too. Yeah, that makes sense. I think one reason that people sometimes don't take this approach is that it has this feeling of a sense of arbitrariness, especially when you're kind of figuring out what factors to include and and, and how much weight to give them. I mean, in general, again, I know the research suggests that this kind of thing in generally improves improves decision making, though it has to be complemented by <laughs> by also knowing something about these uh, th- these countries personally. But then I do feel discomfort when I'm just sticking random numbers in, into a thing just based on like overall judgment. Do you feel that discomfort? And is that something you've maybe tried the tried to get the organization to overcome? Yeah, I mean, we we try to set up panels to set up what these numbers should be so that it's not based on one person's opinion. And you know, someone said to me a long time ago that it's it's better to do this than to not do it. It gives you a better answer than not trying. And I think that that holds true. But I do think you have to back it up with the qualitative to go deeper on some of these things to make sure that you're not 
lending yourself to someone's particular bias. But there is always a human bias to these. And that's important to recognize. That's important to kind of recognize who's doing the research. And, you know, in this in this age in which we're hi- heightened awareness about diversity, equity, inclusion, you have to think about that. Who is doing this research? Who's setting the agenda? Is it a white man or a black woman? And that's going to make a difference in terms of the outcome of the research. And so you have to have the diversity and equity and inclusion panel that helps you come to a more fair conclusion that will be more reflective of the reality. Yeah, I think it can feel risky to kind of delegate a decision to a, to a spreadsheet in this way. And, and <laughs> especially one where you're like, you become very aware of how arbitrary some of the some of the numbers are that you're, that you're putting in there. But I guess it's, it's important to realize that when you give a kind of guest out impression of which countries you think are most promising, your brain is doing that internally somewhere, it has to do something to kind of weight these different factors that are in your head. The thing is, it's just like, not as explicit. <laughs> right, it's just being explicit about this algorithm, you know, and putting it down. And, you know, I think that it's, the, like I said, the qualitative also lends itself to give us some interesting results. And we asked some interesting survey questions that, yeah, were very interesting to help us hone in on which countries would be the right ones to enter into. Yeah. If a spreadsheet method chucks out an answer that's really surprising, it's a, that, that, that's a very good prompt to go back and double check. If it said Mo- Moldova's the place, then <laughs> maybe go and check. You haven't put a typo. <laughs> yeah, then I would be suspicious somebody wants to live in Moldova. And that, you know, <laughs> uh, I, no, I do think there's a common sense you know, check that has to be done. It, there shouldn't be huge surprises that come out of here. We did have a few surprises when we did the qualitative poll. Like we did polls of countries. That was really interesting. So we did public attitudes towards farmed animals, and there were there were some surprises. We surveyed 350 adults in each of those six countries that I named, and as part of the qualitative research. So even there's quantitative in the qualitative research, and you know Japan was a surprise actually. So for example, they they thought a diet without animal products can't be healthy. Like 16% thought a diet without animal products can be healthy. Only 16%. Whereas Singapore thought 53%. And, you know, I think that it was it was a little surprising. But then when you look culturally into there, there's a huge vegetarian population. And that kind of explains explains that why they think it's healthy, why they think it's, you know, they're excited about it because they're already eating it. Whereas Japan being an island, which is heavily seafood based, less so. Something that Lewis Bollard mentioned is that he's maybe been a bit surprised by how promising work in Latin America seems to be. I guess, at least, at least for me, you know, I don't associate Brazil or Mexico with vegetarianism or people being especially, especially open to caring a lot about animals. But uh, it, it seemed like the campaigns were going, going reasonably well there. Is this true? And did you kind of have a theory for why that might be? Well, Brazil is going really well. And I can tell you a little bit about that. The Brazil corporate market is made up very similar to the United States in that there is a monopoly held and most of the by a few companies and also most people purchase their food products in a grocery store or in restaurants so that automatically lends itself that our institutional intervention model will work there in the sense that if you target McDonald's or you target Walmart or you target these companies that they you know you'll get a lot of bang for your buck also you know Mercy for Animals started its offices over five years ago now in Brazil, and we actually first focused on building grassroots efforts. And we have a quite extensive, like 800 volunteers, and we have a national council of volunteers who help drive the change and direct the kinds of campaigns we want to run. And they're very strong and they're very um, they're, they're advocating for a lot of change. There's a real culture of grassroots advocacy that exists there to complement a model that I think will work. Mexico has actually been harder to make progress in the corporate institutional change because most people are not buying their eggs or their meats in a grocery store. They're still buying them in informal markets, which is the same in India, for example. So the corporate model is less easy to you know, put pressure on one company and advocate for a lot of change because the producers hold more power. The producers are selling directly to like a local market. People think that's grandma's backyard chicken, but it's not. But what we have found effective in Latin America, we just released this scoring card And we score companies against each other based on their cage-free commitments. And we received Reuters coverage for that. And it was so fascinating because the companies hated to be at the bottom of this ladder, right? (laughs) No one wants to be at the bottom of a ladder. And we had companies switch their policies before we went live because they didn't want to be one rung lower. 
And so we told them, this is where you're gonna be. And they're like, wait, 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 what can we do to move one rung up? And we'd say, well, you need to make your policy public or you need to put a date on there. So they would rush to, to change that. So, you know, the, the strategies are not the same everywhere and you really can't just do cookie cutter model, but, you know, I think it's really shown potential in the region and I'm excited about that too. Why were they concerned about doing poly on this index? Is it that just the general public is kind of interested in, in these indices and it gets media coverage and, it, and it's bad for their brand or, or maybe, maybe bad for staff retention? I, on, I mean, I've used this tool throughout my career and nobody wants to be at the bottom of the ladder. Nobody wants to be the worst. They just don't. You know, human beings are naturally competitive and they do not want to be at the bottom of this ladder, including companies. You know, this is part of corporate engagement is looking to companies and saying, okay, here are the five simple things you need to do and making them super clear and super easy and creating that pathway for companies is half the battle. And the ladder or this kind of rating system does that. And I think it really plays into the, the fact that these companies are competitive with each other. And we do work in competitive markets where everyone's year, you know, they're living quarter to quarter trying to increase their share and increase their profits every quarter. They're trying to do that. And they never want to do anything that would put them below a competitor. And so it plays on that. And it's, it's a powerful tool. Yeah. I wonder whether it's somehow exploiting something about corporate culture that like once someone can complain that or a boss can complain to a subordinate, you know, we're at the bottom of this ladder, what are you doing about it? And it looks bad on like, you know, reports that they'll be writing internally about staff performance and so on. Somehow, even if like it doesn't really connect to sales, perhaps you're hijacking the decision making process within an organization because this is the kind of thing that they recognize a hierarchy of like best to worst. And they don't want to like have them be a little lower. Yeah. I mean, part of our objective is just to get the subject in the boardrooms. You know, how do we get the subject into the board directors and say, this has to be discussed. And then, you know, one of our strategies is often when we launch a campaign is to write to the board of directors. As a president, the most annoying thing in the world to me is when the, somebody writes to my board members and then the board forwards it to me and says, can you deal with this? And I'm like, oh, oh. yeah. So <laughs> equally, if you're the head of McDonald's and the board is your, the board is getting tons of emails from advocates and then that is turning into something that the president has to do. That is a powerful tool. No, you know, our job is to push this up the priority list. So they have to make it go away and they have to do something about it. That's part of our, our role. Yeah. Let's come back to talking about these corporate welfare campaigns. We talked about the, the Costco campaign at the outset. I guess, how do you think these corporate welfare campaigns are going overall? Are they continuing to kind of exceed expectations? In some countries, in Brazil, they're definitely exceeding expectations where we're getting, we have the largest supermarkets in Brazil who are coming on board with going cage-free, for example. In some countries, no. In Mexico, it's been much slower. And in the United States, we've had over 200 companies go cage-free. We've had over 200 companies agree to adopt the better chicken commitment, which is reducing the suffering of chickens in the supply chain. But we have some real holdouts with big companies. Europe is going faster on broilers. They're going faster than we anticipated. So I still think it's a valid strategy, but I also think sometimes one of our mistakes as a movement is we lean too heavily on one intervention and we're not creative. We get comfortable in one intervention. So, you know, I think we have to be careful about not getting too comfortable with this intervention and really thinking through alternatives and options and I do think that the ranking is something we haven't used enough and is a very powerful tool. And I think we'll be using more of that in future. And we've relied too heavily on the like doing an investigation, then running a corporate campaign and putting negative pressure. So, you know, that is the typical strategy that we follow and it has worked. It's been very, very effective, the negative campaigning. But I think we need to be creative and think of other solutions, too. Yeah, it sounds like you think that the corporate campaigns might be kind of a stepping stone to a different strategy later on. Do you have any idea of what that what that future strategy might be? Well, I do think it, the the next step to that is legislative change. So, is that what you mean, or a part of corporate still? Yeah, I was thinking of uh, policies focused on on corporations, but but I suppose may, maybe it is like once you've gotten enough companies on board, then you do just move on to the to the policy change, and you don't have to use the companies as intermediaries. Yeah, I think that I do see that that what wor- that's what worked with. Prop 12. And now we're kind of quietly going through state by state and getting cage bans achieved, like in different in different states without running campaigns at all, just through legislative conversations. And I think the goal is always to do things in a way that is less costly and, you know, faster. 
And getting these companies on board can be very expensive. And so what you do is you try to get the biggest company on board that creates a domino effect, right? That gets everyone to fall. And then once you get a critical mass, then we're going to go for state-based. And then we get critical mass of state-based, then we get federal. And that is the goal. And then we can work, then when that happens, then things like subsidies can change. And there's a much more positive landscape and environment for getting bigger changes achieved. Yeah. How serious is the issue of corporations slipping on their pledges or, you know, trying to trying to slip out of them uh, over time? Oh, well, yeah, that is very common and it's very possible for that to happen. But we also know that when we see that happening, we are on it very quickly. And quite often companies will quickly go back and put the policy back in place. So enforcement is a really, really important part of our strategy. And at one point we calculated like what percentage effort was needed for the commitment versus the enforcement. And it's about half and half. And, you know, I think sometimes we spend too much resources, time and effort and thinking on the commitment side, but actually we need to spend equal, if not more, on the enforcement side of the tools. And that's where these ratings, these rankings come in place. We had a, a recent situation in Canada. Yeah, just Mark, just this last month, the Retail Council of Canada announced that it was revoking all of its animal welfare commitments for pigs and hens, which they had banned cages and crates, essentially. It had agreed that all of their members would be banning cages and crates and, and made made in the name of its members. And, and so... What was, was the reason? We think part of it is that they thought that, that we had taken our eye off the ball. We were busy with other things and that... They figured there'd be no repercussions. Well, the Retail Council of Canada, you know, said they basically said the sourcing the, of the, the stuff was difficult, which is not true. And we immediately jumped into action, contacting the RCC and the current grocery store members. So Loblaws is, is a big one and Walmart and Metro and all of these big ones. And we've had great success with getting some of the largest retailers to reaffirm their commitment to phasing out gestation crates and, and battery cages. And so Loblaws, for example, confirmed to us that they'll be restoring their policy within a couple of weeks with additional language. So we have to always, like that is the enforcement part. We cannot take our eye off the ball. And if we do, they'll happily not do it, I think, half the time because it's expensive and it's it's a bother to them. We had to you know, individually call up these companies and, and persuade them that if they didn't, we'd be running campaigns. So it seems like you kind of always have to have your enforcement machinery at the ready because as soon as it becomes like too costly for you to actually enforce the thing, then they might try to try to try to slip out of it. So you always have to have the the, the sort of Damocles hanging over these companies. Uh, we in order have to, to be vigilant. Yeah, we're vigilant. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Are there any kind of strategies that you can use to to make this easier? I suppose if the if the pledges are over a shorter period of time, then you don't have to kind of keep the the machinery running for as long. You know, waiting for the time when they're when they're meant to meet the pledge. Maybe that's difficult for other reasons, but. I think the annual ranking is going to be helpful as we move forward. Oh, yeah. We're looking into that more because they'll know it's coming every year, that we're watching every year. It's not something we always have to be watching, but we're going to be coming back regularly. And they'll know that we're going to be coming back regularly and they're going to, their competitors are going to be judged too. So they're not going to want to fall down on that ladder or fall down on that commitment because it'll be exposed through the rankings. Yeah. Do you have to have a system to kind of go and audit these companies to make sure that they're not just not just lying to you? Or maybe that the fact that they're public companies makes that kind of outright fraud pretty risky for them legally. Exactly. And we give more points if they publicly disclose. And so they're higher up if they publicly disclose. They can tell us, but it doesn't count for as much as if they they can tell us privately, but it doesn't count if they if they are just telling us. I was thinking more as, you know, a company might claim to be sourcing a particular fraction of its eggs from cage free eggs, but maybe maybe they're just not doing that and they're and they're, and they're lying to you but that doesn't, doesn't seem likely to you? It doesn't seem likely because the issues legally would be very risky for them as a company. Yeah, uh, yeah, that'll be, um, the, the downsides would be, would be greater than the, than the upside. So I guess it sounds like if you're spending roughly half of your resources on enforcement and, and half of it on getting the original pledge, that I suppose if people thought that there was no, going to be no enforcement, uh, which I guess potentially some people have done cost effectiveness estimates on this uh, in, in the past that maybe didn't include that aspect, it, it would roughly halve the, the cost effectiveness. But nonetheless, it looks like, very good initially. So the fact that there are these extra costs <laughs> that maybe hadn't been fully acknowledged uh, at, at the outset probably isn't enough to suggest that it's like it's not uh, not an effective intervention and not worth pursuing. Yeah, I think there's kind of a mis miseducation in the donor world a little bit that getting a commitment yeah. is enough and then you're done. And actually, we need investment to continue the work and continue the enforcement side. And equally, I think there's the 
pre the, the work before a commitment is secured, which is that piece I spoke about earlier about public awareness and building. So there's like kind of three phases of investment in getting a change on animal welfare, which is like the public awareness, like building that that base of public opinion to make it important enough on the priority list of a company, then, then there's a time at which it's ripe to go for a commitment. And then once commitment secured, there's the third piece, which is the enforcement side. In listening to some of your recent podcasts, I was kind of surprised to hear how hard it has become to do undercover investigations, at least in the United States, because of these ag gag laws. Because I, I had naively thought that these ag gag laws would like never stand up in court and that the First Amendment considerations would, in, would ensure that you'd be free to, 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 to publish this, this information. But it sounds like maybe, maybe they are holding up in court. I, I, I've been keeping track of this. So. Yeah, um, there are still 13 states, I think, in which we cannot do undercover investigations or in some way, shape or form, it is legally very, very uh, risky for us to do so. And mm. lo and behold, those are the states where the majority of factory farms are, of course. And those states are more run by officials that are amenable to that and make it more challenging at the state base to change that law. So we are limited in the United States. As an organization that's getting larger and larger, we have a larger target on our back and companies or the ag industry would love to sue us and take us down. So we have to be even, as we get larger, we have to be more and more and more careful. And that's really challenging. It's challenging us to think of new ways to get footage. So we're using drones, for example, where the law hasn't caught up with you know, the methodology, we still have to follow it. We still do follow the law and we have to get license and things like that, but it's, we're getting, and, and the technology is getting so great with drones that we can get close up with some of these things. And honestly, the, the transformation piece is also very interesting. And what I did with Craig, where a farmer is inviting you on legally, openly to film with excellent cameras, to go and film inside a farm and show exactly what's going on. That's, that's actually, I think a, a bigger, you know, one of the, in the United States anyway, a, a place where we're going to find a lot of opportunities. Yeah, let's let's talk about the uh, transformation program. What what does it do in brief? Transformation as a project is about transitioning farmers from factory farming to plant based, but it's really more than that. It's about flipping the narrative. And right now, animal rights activists are seen as people who come into rural areas and take away jobs and take away choices and we're trying to say the opposite, that actually we're here to build something better and that building something better can create bridges all kinds of places. So especially legislatively. So we're finding huge doors are opening for us in, in that space. So basically it's providing advice to farmers on how to convert their farm from, I guess, primarily from farming animals to doing to, to producing crops. Is, is that the, the gist? Yeah. So we provide consultancy and we do a lot of promotional work for them too. So we'll take videos and social media promotion, but we have consultants for hemp and mushrooms and then converting of their houses. We do not provide any capital to them in terms of building materials or labor, but we provide the know-how, the resources, we help build business plans. We feature them on our website. So we have a portal where farmers can write to us and say, I'm sick of this. I want to get out. Can you help me? And you would be shocked at how many people are writing us and wanting. We have way more farmers that want out than we can directly help. So we're going to be creating a resource hub that farmers can just download their own business plan. They can work on it in a pathway. We have, there's two types of farmers. There's a farmer with high debt and almost no debt. And so we're kind of creating two separate pathways for those farmers to be able to follow, download, and kind of go for it on their own. And it's a really exciting because they also... Have each have their stories, and each of their stories tell us something we didn't know before about the poultry industry. And they also, you know, invite us to come see what's going on. And there's so uh, many different yeah. companies. Like we have all over the country, farmers are inviting us onto farms and talking to us and showing us what's happening. And that is huge. That is a huge bridge we're creating. And where ag gag laws are keeping us out, the farmers are inviting us in. Yeah, I, I hadn't. I hadn't caught on to that aspect of this program. If you're creating this kind of magnet for all of the people who are very keen to get out of the industry and maybe about to get out of the industry and maybe are kind of willing to kick their <laughs> kick, kick, kick the parent company on the on on the way out the door. Yeah, nearly half of poultry farmers incur a loss every year. That's yeah. the amount that I expect won out. That is the and even the ones that are having an income. They're making seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars. So all we have to do is provide something above that. It's not that hard. We just have to beat that. 
And, you know, collectively there is $5.2 billion in debt. So that is a huge amount of debt. And the only way we're going to shift that debt is through government intervention. So that's why we're working at the government level to maybe tap, like tap into appropriations or for example, Cory Booker put forward a bill called the Farm Systems Reform Act that gave debt relief to farmers who wanted to transition. So, and this was supported by Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. So it's not like a, a small time you know, action. This is where we're really looking at getting farmers out of the situation, providing them some debt relief and moving towards things that are both environmentally sustainable, better for rural economies and, you know, moving us away from factory farming. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose the more people leave the industry, the more it drives up costs, I suppose, for the companies that are trying to buy this chicken because there's fewer people it. making chicken. Oh, you it's fantastic. It. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess, yeah, my first thought hearing about this about this intervention was thinking like, this seems like something that is more, perhaps more naturally run as a business rather than as a nonprofit, because this sounds like agricultural consulting. And maybe that's a way that you could scale up, scale it a whole lot, as you know, charge $100 to have a, to talk to these farmers for a couple of hours about what, they, what their options and how they could get out. And then, you, then you've got like a natural revenue model. It may end up being that. You know, this is, we launched it in November 2019, and it's an experiment. We had a pilot year and it's gone so well that it may end up turning into a separate organization eventually. And GFI, I don't know if you know this, the Good Food Institute was started by Mercy for Animals and we gave the initial funding for that. And similarly, we're like, this is better off as its own thing and now it's taken off. And this may be another situation where it's better off as its own organization or, or, or profit business, you know? Yeah. I guess, yeah, just returning to the to the issue of the, of the farmers having such bad conditions, I find it, so <laughs> as an economist, when I, when I hear that, you know, half of them are making a loss, I'm like, can this be true? Like, there, is there something misleading about this, about this metric? Because it just doesn't make any sense that people would stay in this industry if like, and, and it would seem just unsustainable because they would just be like losing money and eventually they would be like driven into bankruptcy and they simply wouldn't be able to continue even if they, if they, if they wanted to. Are we kind of maybe in a disequilibrium where the situation is unsustainable and it isn't going to continue, but it can run for a while before things shut down? Yeah, I think this is the magic of it for me is when I stumbled across this realization, I thought this is not a workable model. People are not going to be happy with this. They are definitely going to opt out of this if they're given another choice. And so I think that it, what the industry did is, as you said earlier, they, anything that was risky in the business, they gave to somebody else, they gave to the farmers. So the two risks are raising the birds and all that capital around it and then the environmental. So they also have to pay for all the waste. So farmers are responsible for all the waste, not the companies. So they've externalized these two costs. Like if the birds die, the farmer pays for it. And if there's pollution, the farmers pay for it. And at the same time, they're putting these farmers in debt. So it is unsustainable. Half of the poultry farmers are are losing money and quitting. I will tell you like my nightmare scenario that we're starting, like the thing that I I worry about that I'm starting to see are mega farms, like big, big mega farms where there's 50 houses. So we've spotted one in North Carolina run by Mount Air. And it's where there are, you know, visas given to somebody from Vietnam in this case who come over and a family will come over and wherever they're coming from is much worse. And so they're like, the economic opportunities here is good. So in a way, they're they're not going to be employing American farmers anymore. Instead, they'll contract someone who's in a much worse situation, give them a visa in exchange, and then they're going to come and work here and then create mega farms, 50, you know, houses. And we fl- I flew over one in a, in a biplane where I was looking, you know, in a small, small plane and, and saw the, it was shocking, shocking how many houses there were. And it was being run by one family. And, you know, that's a totally different scenario. And I, and I do worry about that. I worry about who is the industry going to figure out to replace as this cohort of, of farmers get unhappy and want to leave, who's going to replace them? Because people are still eating chickens. We have to tackle it from all angles. There's never one, one angle. But it is definitely, yeah. you know, if we move fast enough, if we work with this, there's a lot we can do with poultry farmers to take out some of the bricks in the wall. Yeah. Yeah, just bracketing that issue of low wage workers from from overseas for a second. M- might there be a great intervention opportunity in trying to identify people who are considering going into chicken farming and just informing them, like saying, "Would you like to do an interview with someone who is currently doing chicken farming about yeah. what it is actually like working for this company?" That is what Craig Watts does now. That's his job. Okay, Craig that's his job. Oh, wow, is it? Yeah, he's a farmer advocate. So he actually works with an organization called SRAP. I forget what it stands for, but he's a he's a farmer outreach advocate. And he goes into farming communities and says, don't sign this contract. Don't be part of this. This is so yeah, that is definitely important and a strategy. Who pays for that? Is that is that donor funded? 
Yes, it's a nonprofit called SREP. Okay, we'll move on from MFA in a second. But I guess if someone kind of personally gave you $1 billion with the goal of you know, telling you to use it to try to improve animal welfare, do you have any sense of where you were, what, what you would do if you had far more resources? Like how, how might you be able to scale up to that, to that kind of level? So Dylan Matthews asked me this question and actually wrote an article about it in Vox oh, right. a while back. He asked a bunch of us this question and then created an article based on this. So I do have an answer to that, which I had given him. And the first step, I think, would be to create a kind of international panel to end factory farming, like the international panels for climate change that exist. So bringing together the sympathetic experts and academia industry and really creating a global stage and global targets for, for this and really putting resources into that. And then key areas that we think that, that I think that the committee would work on would be significant resources into movement building and expansion into some of the non-US countries like Southeast Asia, India, Brazil, China. And these are countries you know, where 98% of animals reside outside of the United States and MFAs really wants to move into, but just doesn't have the resources. And we have to put a lot of money into doing that. Another would be gaining political power in the U.S. and other key regions. So I would love to create like a pact and like a 501c4 that just focuses on this. But then really we could make more uh, money appropriated to funds like we were talking about for R&D, for plant-based and cell-based food, for ending subsidies to factory farming. You know, money, money is political power in this country and we don't have any here for farmed animals and then build a people powered political movement alongside of that. So similar to like, you know, the NRA, but for yeah. <laughs> farmed animals and, <laughs> um, and, you know, invest in practical solutions that will in the short term, you know, reduce the suffering of farmed animals on key animal welfare issues. Fish welfare is, you know, really not being touched at all. Broiler welfare is actually pretty light as well. And then, Big advertising budget, huge global advertising budget, um, really investing in educating folks on the dangers, but also the alternatives. I can't speak highly enough of like the need for advertising is what's shaped, for example, Americans' food choices. It's what shapes all of our choices in, in, in the market. So we need tons and tons of money, these kind of story wars that exist. We need to outcompete them in, in terms of the smart marketing narratives that exist out there. So that's just a few ideas, but. Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, that's, that sounds like a billion dollars roughly spent. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously we'll stick up a link to that, to that Dylan Matthews article. So you can, get, yeah, maybe, maybe get a few more details and see what other people had to say about that. Love that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Great idea for a question, Dylan. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's expand from MFA and think about the, uh, the animal movement as a whole. Do you have any interesting disagreements with other folks in the movement? I'm thinking in particular, you know, smart researchers like Lewis Bollard or perhaps the folks at Animal Charity Evaluators or, you know, other people you typically agree with, but where, you know, there's like kind of an interesting dialogue because uh, you don't see eye to eye. Oh, yeah. Let's see. So I do disagree with, I think we've talked a little bit about this, but measuring impact as a result of a short-term action. So I think that we measure ineffective altruism too short back. Um, the impact. So, and that can really have detrimental impacts and create disappointment and perceived failure because we're comparing to a previous action where we measured too short of a term. So for example, cage-free eggs, we had this really exciting period of four or five years where we got a lot of cage-free victories. And that then led to us thinking the exact same strategy would, would work just as fast for broilers when we didn't take into account that there had been Europe, in Europe, there had been decades of work on this already in the, in the public mind and same in, in the United States. There have been decades of work done on getting people to think through cages and crates. So I, I do think that there's something that needs to be done and, and we, you know, around that. Another area I disagree with is moves in philanthropy to just fund plant-based companies. And we have a lot of like the venture capital folks who are like, forget advocacy, it's never going to work, and we're just going to put money into the Impossible Burger. And as I said earlier, I think without our work, this pressure, this moral pressure, this inter internalizing of the external costs and driving up the animal welfare costs, and then also creating a free marketing wing where we're exposing their competitors, I think the push for their products would not be there. So I think it's complementary, and I think it's a mistake to only invest in, in the plant-based companies. I've also been told that, you know, writing books and documentaries and films and things like that is not that effective. And I disagree. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. I guess this, this this goes back to the potentially the first point that you're saying this this maybe builds support that in general you can use later, even if it's not immediately apparent. Yes, exactly. So I think that you know narratives create the groundwork for us then having the successes later, and they're really important. And I think they're diff- the problem is they're really difficult to measure. They're more in that qualitative space, and that's where we struggle as a movement, especially in the effective altruist world. Like, how do we you know how do we measure that? And that plays a transformation too. So I've been told like, why are you doing transformation? You're just shifting one farm. Who cares? Like that's not gonna, it'll just be, they'll just be replaced by another one. But I think it's about the story we tell as well and leveraging that narrative and changing the narrative about who animal rights folks are. They were not just these adversarial, you know, people coming to take jobs away from rural America and choices away from meat eaters. We're actually building something better that benefits everyone. So it's, it's that narratives are really important. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I guess a lot of the kind of effective animal activism stuff that I'm aware of has always used this thing of, you know, did we convince someone to become vegetarian? Did we change their diet as as, as the output? And it seems like maybe that was a, a red herring, potentially, that uh, maybe like, you know, leafleting, all of these, these, these things that we've tended to go a bit cold on, potentially they, they could be useful because they were shifting people's attitudes, shifting their beliefs, even if they weren't, weren't shifting their, 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 their diets. I guess there's value in doing a like a narrow cost effectiveness analysis. We go like, well, do, how many vegetarians do, do we create per dollar? There, there's value in that. But it can also potentially narrow your focus such that you miss other things that are, that are going on that are, that are important. Exactly. That's really well put. Exactly. I couldn't yeah. say it better. On, on the second point that we should put most of our resources into the plant-based meat companies, I'm not sure whether I agree with that, but I can kind of I can kind of see where they're coming from. I can kind of see the the, the, the intuitive case there. I suppose you would hit a limit perhaps where these companies do just have access to all kinds of funds that nonprofits like Mercy for Animals don't have. So even if you know in general we think the food companies are like all else equal, potentially more effective. <laughs> Once they've got 10x the funding or 100x the funding, then maybe maybe that switches around. There's also kind of an argument that the effectiveness can't be so different because you're potentially creating staff for these companies and you're creating demand for the product, which then drives investors to, to put money into it. So in as much as those companies are an extremely valuable intervention, then things that support it have to also, like they, they can hitchhike on that and potentially, uh, potentially that they also have to have some level of uh, cost effectiveness as well. Yeah, uh, do you have anything to add on that? Well, no, I just think there's a, there's a, there's a synergy that is often, or a, a value that's under, that's under recognized. And I think that, I don't know how, it'd be interesting to see if someone did a study on like the marketing value or the kind of market that advocacy groups create or the negative advertising that we create for the competition or some about like if we could value that maybe that would be like oh we're going to charge you for that impossible burger <laughs> like that would be an interesting <laughs> you know or investors like this is this is our value to you uh, we will send you the invoice so <laughs> yeah i mean well it's an interesting question i suppose if you tried to to build these companies or or if you tried to get them to to give money to you i suppose you might you would run into this problem that there's multiple different companies and so they might not be willing to fund you because you benefit the entire industry the entire right. plant-based uh, meat meat industry but let's say hypothetically that it was just one company and because they're a commercial company and it's a bad look they couldn't run the campaigns that you're running but would they be interested in donating as a corporation because in fact you're offering better value for money in terms of marketing than they can offer themselves like just advertising their products directly it's kind of interesting hypothetical yeah and it's very genuine too like ours is not to get a profit for our product so consumers might trust us more because ours is coming from strictly you know a more third party perspective and so that could be very trusted in that sense yeah how has the farmed animal movement kind of evolved over the, the last 20 years that, that you've been involved with it? I suppose perhaps apart from just the general professionalization, are there any other interesting changes? Well, there's a lot more women leaders now. So that's been good to see over after Me Too. I think there was a big switch out and, you know, th- there were a lot of women that became leaders. And I think we're trying to become a more diverse movement as well. So after BLM in the United States and other countries, there's been a far higher awareness of the need to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion into our our work and how that will make us the most effective possible. I think there's been a, a really good understanding of not fighting with each other internally and moving away from, like, we can have healthy debates and constructive debates that lead to positive outcomes and that we all have a shared vision and fighting with each other is not the right approach. I think in the beginning of any movement, there's quite a lot, and you see this in other social justice movements about, like, what is the right way? And as we've grown bigger, we've realized there's a lot of ways and we're all pushing the big giant boulder up the hill and we need a lot of people to do it. 
Yeah, it's a, I think when people think about coordination and cooperation, they often imagine you know, people collaborating on a project together. One thing I like to say is kind of sometimes the best form of coordination and cooperation is just to let one another be and just let other people do their thing without <laughs> hassling them and being always being up in their business about how they ought to change what they want to do. And it's so tempting to do that because you think you have the right idea, you think you have good advice, but sometimes you have to say your thing and then, and then walk away if they don't agree. Totally. I, I think as long as... That's the, the concept of like the tyranny of the small differences. And we get caught up in those sometimes. And instead of realizing we, we all have the same vision of where we want to end up and let's all just, you know, work towards that in our different ways. And that's okay. Yeah. Are there any ways that the animal movement has taken steps backwards in your, in your view? Hmm. I don't know. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I don't think it has. Yeah. I don't know. Well, one thing I thought you thought you might say is perhaps it's maybe I haven't been, haven't been around uh, for long enough, but it seems like the animal movement has become maybe more associated in the US with kind of progressive politics. And I wonder whether that might make it more difficult to reach out to Republicans or reach out to people in, in rural areas who have kind of a different different culture and different politics. It's true that our the legislative support has been primarily from folks like Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, but I have great hope and optimism through the transformation path that we're working with rural farmers that we're going to find those bridges. And we already are. So there is bipartisan support for building rural economies and finding small farmers freedom in their economic choices. So I, if that, that, that could, you know, it definitely, it is a tendency for the movement itself and the employees and the team members are primarily progressive liberals. And I would definitely like to see that change and to incorporate other values. And I actually think that transformation is attracting that. Transformation is attracting and, and you know, we've, we're hiring different folks and it's, it's fun. It's fun to, to be with folks that have grown up in rural America that are, have different political perspectives and bring some different solutions and knowledge to the table. It's actually really, really been a positive experience so far. Yeah, we were saying just then that uh, sometimes the best thing to do is just let people do their thing. But in your just a personal opinion, if you if someone came to you for advice, are there any kind of interventions or approaches that the animal movement is still engaged in that you think might be underrated or, or overrated? Well, I would say underrated still is inclusivity, diversity, and inclusion. I think we are we really need actually seriously need to build an equity mindset into our strategies. And if you think, for example, in the United States, the fastest growing vegan community are African-Americans. And look at our, our team members. They are primarily white folks. So if we really want to be successful, we need to broaden our tent. And when I say you know, in, in, in diversity doesn't just mean racial diversity. It means political diversity. It means religious diversity. I mean, I would say the, like the, the majority of our staff are white liberal atheists, like that's primarily who we attract. And that's not the population. So, I mean, that is the population in in white, but I think that we need to work harder at being diverse and then creating an inclusive workplace and, and, and we'll create new programs as a result that we've never thought of before that are going to be effective. Like we are just too same, same. And if we're going to be successful, we need to think of new solutions to be create new solutions. We have to attract new people from different backgrounds. And so that is featuring heavily in our three-year strategy. Uh, it's highly underrated by the movement. And I think we need to work a lot harder on that. Yeah. It seems like over the last couple of years, animal organizations have been talking a lot more about those issues. Do you, do you think like meaningful progress has been made or maybe has it been like more talk than, than actual change? I think meaningful progress is starting, but there's a lot of work to do. I think we're just realizing how far away we are from that and the dangers of staying so insular and narrow in our approaches and how that does not create the broadest tent and how we'll be more successful if we're more inclusive, diverse and equitable. Because when you already have an organization that is majority or maybe super majority, people who are liberal, people who are atheists, I imagine it's it's actually like a non-trivial challenge to make it more diverse politically, ideologically, racially. Yeah. What things can you do to get that started? Because it might be a difficult, you know, if I was a Trump supporting conservative religious person from the country, maybe it would just be a difficult workplace because I wouldn't have as many natural friends. And, and, that, oh, yeah. and, that's, that's, and that's not because anyone's kind of being evil. It's just a, <laughs> the way things are. Yeah, no, that's what inclusive means, right? Like it means a place where it, diversity is where just you add 
different people from different social identities and inclusive means like where people feel they'll be successful from those different social identities. And so you could attract, a, you know, a person from, let's say a different background, let's say a black vegan activist who or a Hispanic or a Latino a vegan activist and no one else there is of that social identity. And how are they going to feel? Are they going to feel successful? Are they going to feel isolated? Are they going to be successful? And um, so you have to then think there's two things that we've thought of. So one of them is leadership. So leadership has to, when people look on our job site, when they apply for our job, one thing that we've heard is they'll look at our board. They'll look at our board, they'll look at our leadership and they'll see what they look like, right? They'll see how many women are, how many men, how many people of color. And you can't tell the other things, right? But you can see the visuals. And so that has an effect on who, if, if a black person sees no one there, a whole white, or if a woman sees like only male leaders, they're not going to want to work there. And so you have to increase it at the top. You also have to make programs that are meaningful to those social identities, right? So or those racial identities. So for example, you know, if, if you want to do something about rural economies and you want to attract people from rural economies, you have to do something about rural economies. Or if you want to do something about religious identities and you have to have a program with religious identities. So we have to think through those aspects. So we started a program called we had a program called Plants to the People, which was about delivering plant-based meals in, during the pandemic to people in need. And this was a way to kind of get into certain communities that we know we weren't in with. And we provided those meals from vegan restaurants. So we had the vegan restaurants deliver, deliver these meals. And that was a totally different program we had never done. It was, I wouldn't say a replicable model, but it was a different kind of program. Uh, so you have to, and, and now we're thinking, okay, what else can we do if we want to talk to different communities? What programs will be meaningful to different communities? Yeah, I'd heard that vegetarianism or veganism was growing in particular among African American communities in the in the in the, in the U.S. Is there an interesting story there as to as to why that's happening? So there's two sides of it. One is health. One is the fact that African American communities are plagued with communicable that sorry the the chronic non communicable yeah non communicable diseases like heart disease diabetes obesity and they're targeted in food deserts and live in communities where there's less access to fresh food and so there's a push in those communities to kind of own their health and own improvement there's also a real push for like an anti colonial diet like a real you know this is not our diet so many african americans are lactose intolerant for example and yet you know, milk is being given in schools, it's being pushed, and it's really bad. It's a, it's really bad for, for health. So there's a real push for an anti-colonial diet, which is not in, uh, incorporating and, and taking back, you know, the taking back of the diet. And so and I live in Atlanta, for example, and there's just this huge burgeoning kind of Black vegan activism around food, but it has nothing to do with animal rights. It's all about kind of black power and health and community. And it's really interesting to see. So for example, there's a, a burger place called Slutty Vegan, which is fantastic. And it has <laughs> things like the, the threesome burger, you know, it's got like really trendy little silly names run by a, a woman named Pinky Cole. It's all vegan. It's hugely popular, but it's, it's about health. It's about black power. And it's also about building community. So she gives a lot to the community. She gives scholarships. She's like helping the community out. And so it's really interesting. See, this is totally happening outside of our movement, right? Outside of the animal rights movement. This is happening, you know, not because of us, but in spite of us. And that's a very, very interesting trend, which you think, well, that's very important to pay attention to. If the largest, the fastest growing community has nothing to do with us, what's going on there? Like, what is happening? That's important to pay attention to. How important do you think Biden's win was for farmed animals in the United States? So as a nonprofit and the president of a nonprofit, I have to say completely nonpartisan on this question. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I do. I'm, I am hopeful for some of the changes. I will say we were organizationally less than happy about the secretary of agriculture selection, which was Tom Filsack came to us straight from the dairy industry. That's what he'd been doing in the last, you know, few years. And we had hoped for somebody else, Marsha Fudge, and, and other others who might have been more sympathetic. So I'm hopeful that he's prioritized climate change. And I think that there's a there can be a natural dovetailing there with factory farming. But time will tell. Time will tell. Yeah. 
I thought that it might be might be relatively easy to stay nonpartisan there because when I asked Lewis this question, he was like, well, you might think it would make a big difference, but the reality is that, you know, at the national level, the difference in policy between the Democrats and Republicans is not, not nearly as large as you might expect intuitively. Yeah, especially on agriculture and animal agriculture, because these industries, if you look at the lobbying spend on these companies, they generally give equally to both sides and, you know, they hedge their bets. So unfortunately, the United States doesn't have the kind of limits that Europe has, for example, on this. And it's one of the biggest fundamental problems with getting legislation passed in favor of farmed animals. Let's do a little bit of a career advice. If a 20-year-old, you know, version of Leah Garces uh, came to you today asking for advice on what to do, they they want to, you know, pursue a career that helps animals, what are some of the places you might recommend they go and study or or work, I guess, other than Mercy for Animals, of course? (laughs) Yeah, I think there are so many places to volunteer and intern. And I will say, check out Mercy for Animals. We do paid internships now. We just changed that to increase accessibility as part of our DEIJ philosophy. And THL, the Humane League, is a great place. Uh, Good Food Institute is a great place. Compassionable Farming is a great place. I even think the larger organizations like HSUS or ASPCA, uh, if you're listening internationally, there's Animals Australia and there's many, many European organizations to look into. And I think volunteering and interning is a good way for you to get a flavor for the culture of an organization and whether you would fit into that culture. I think you could study anything, really. We hire every type of person. As a large organization, we have researchers, we have video editors, we have writers, we have back-end and front-end web editors, we have user experience. We're actually going to be advertising for a user experience designer, so apply if that's you, marketing people. And as we grow professionally as a movement, we need operational people. You know, I think that people think... I certainly did, that you need to go and study zoology or be a vet or ethics or, I don't know, behavior, you know, sociology. And that has helped me frame my career. But when I'm actually, you know, apart from the actual skill set, and as organizations become more professional, we're looking for all kinds of things that help an organization function, especially in the operational space. I look for two things when I hire, and they are optimism and grit. Optimism, because I want, like, I ask people, like, what do you, how do you see things in five to 10 years? And if they're like, oh, it's going to be so hard, and you know, I'm like, no, you, you don't have what it takes. Like, it's going to, you have to have, an, most people I work with have a really optimistic look at the future. We're going to end factory farming. We are. We are. Yeah. And they have grit, <laughs> and they have the grit to do it. No matter how many no's we get, how many failures we get, we just keep plugging along, and they have grit. And so I look for optimism and grit as two things. And you need those things to be able to be successful in this movement. Yeah. Let's talk about that point that no, you're definitely going to end factory farming. I think I, I talked to quite a lot of people concerned about animal well-being and, and they tend to be, I mean, I tended to kind of take that view that it just like, as long as technology keeps advancing, as long as the economy keeps growing, we keep <laughs> increasing our wisdom. It seems like inevitable at some point we will we'll end factory farming, but sometimes I get pushback on that. Is, is that kind of, are you saying that we will get rid of it as kind of a conviction that helps to drive you forward or just as like a neutral forecast about what will happen? I feel like it's a neutral forecast, but people can get down heartened, hardened about it because it is a hard path and there's a lot of failures along the way or it's very slow progress. But I just feel like it's a, it's a math problem. Like there's not enough arable land to keep producing food in this way, given the population and how it's rising. It's just not possible. And companies are looking at that. Demand is changing and the moral awareness is going up. So we're driving up costs of meat. All of those factors together just spell to me, it's going to end. It has to end. And people will look back and go, why did they ever do that? That was a terrible idea. Yeah. I guess I would put front and center the issue of just the meat alternatives coming down in price, or the technology advancing, their price coming down, they're becoming tastier, such that people don't have any particular motivation to eat meat from animals. But it sounds like you think like other factors might be like more central, or maybe you're just adding those because you hadn't mentioned them before. Well, I, I do think that there there is a component in which we're going to run out of land and water. And there, there's a whole, we could talk about this for like another hour, but the amount of arable land that's available which is the land that is grows food and the topsoil is diminishing at rapid rate. So there was a there was an FAO, the United Nations Food and Agriculture paper that said in the UK, for example, there were 60 harvests left if we continue down the pathway. So if you have a piece of land that you're using to raise corn to then feed to factory farmed animals, wouldn't it be more efficient to use both of those pieces of land instead to raise food directly for humans? 
And that's where the efficiency of food production changes, where the equation changes. And when you do that math problem, we're using way too much arable land just to feed factory farmed animals and tortured experiences. And we don't need to do that. And so I think as the population rises to the 10 billion, it's supposed to be by 2050, the math problem tells us very simply, we cannot eat this much meat. We cannot eat this much meat and dairy. And when solutions like cell-based come forward and you're just like producing meat and protein through like a brewery process, it's way more efficient, that will solve that problem. And I think it is just a math problem in many cases. Yeah. So, so the logic there is uh, we'll have less arable land. You know, climate change might make things more, more difficult. There'll be various factors that push up the price of food, that push up the price of wheat and so on. And while, you know, so if wheat prices go up 20%, that's going to increase, if, uh, you know, meat prices, you know, proportionally because they, the, the main input is these, is these other crops and they take up a lot of space uh, besides that. And that will cause people to just out of sheer financial pressure to want to consume less meat. Yeah, I see our job as, is to speed up the transition away from animal agriculture. So it could take different periods of time. It could take a long time, which would mean more suffering of farmed animals or a shorter time. Our job is to speed that up as fast as possible. So we are change makers and the speeders up of this transition to create the least amount of suffering. Yeah, but this isn't my area, but I'm a, I'm a bit more skeptical of, of that channel. And I'll maybe just try to briefly explain why. I guess, you know, we've already had, we've had environmental problems getting worse for, for decades. We've had the population increasing, like actually faster in the past than, than it will be increasing in future. And yet food prices tend to have been like fairly steady or going down, basically because those factors are more than offset by technological improvements that drive down the cost of, of producing grain. So, you know, food prices go up and down, but but the long-term trend is like somewhat, somewhat down. So I guess I could envisage scenarios in which what you're saying exactly happens and the price of food goes up and it creates, the, creates this push. I could also imagine scenarios where kind of just the present continues and things stay the same, or where possibly technological improvements will be so great and we'll have like maybe so much capital investment and, you know, we can use robots, whatever, like, you know, really fine-grained immigration and so on. And even despite all of these factors, the price of grain would go down. So I suppose I wouldn't, at least I wouldn't bank on that as being like the main reason why, uh, why we'll get rid of, rid of meat. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. I think the only thing is when we talk about like food, let's say we take bread, for example, bread has eggs in it sometimes. And, and as, as we've pointed out, we've squeezed all the costs we can out of the animals. They're like at maximum efficiency right now. So if they want to keep maintaining low costs, and we are, you know, creating higher prices for producing eggs, the, they're going to have to turn to something else. And, and that's what we're seeing a big bread company in Mexico do, where they're turning to us and saying, is there a plant-based alternative where we can keep the price point the same because cage free eggs is going to cost too much? And that's exactly what we want to see. So bread stays the same, but the products within bread don't, you know, they, they, they might change. And so that's a good place to start all of those ingredients that are used for like dairy and eggs. And also things like nuggets. Nuggets are whatever, you know, what's inside of a nugget is hardly noticed by the consumer. It's the breading, it's the flavors, things like that. So I think the harder challenge will come when we, we face things like a, you know, a steak or like a breast, the chicken breast or something. That will be, that will be more challenging, but I, I think we'll get there too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could bring up my interview with, with Lewis Bola, but I guess he's the animal person I spoke to most recently. It seems like he is like somewhat worried about our ability to drive down the cost of plant-based alternatives, just thinking that, you know, that the infrastructure for the for the factories might remain somewhat expensive, the technology to actually make them taste good, it, it could be quite hard to drive down the cost. And then there's also a whole lot of issues with clean meat, like how do you get the bioreactors to be cheap enough and to be clean enough? And I suppose it seems like he's like not completely certain that we're going to get, you know, price parity uh, any anytime soon. Do, do you have any view on those technical issues or is that kind of maybe other people's department? Clean meat, I don't. I don't know enough about it. But on the plant-based side, you know, I think part of the strategy is to get the big companies to use their current equipment that they're using for animals and just swap it out. So, and we, we know that they're already investing somewhat in that. And so there's not really a purchase that has to be made, but a swapping out that has to be made. And also we don't have to do price parity. We just have to close the gap. You know, we have to just we have raise one, lower the other till they come to the same or, you know, and they swap. So it doesn't have to be that chicken has to cost what chicken does, like plant based chicken doesn't have to cost what chicken does now. They just have to get closer and they have to then close that gap. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Is there any kind of general advice you'd like to pass on to young or emerging uh, animal advocates to consider beyond what you've, what you've already said? Well, I always tell people to, you know, find what they are passionate about and what they're good at. And that's the intersection in which you're really going to thrive. That might be 
any of the areas I said we hire in. And as your podcast says, 80,000 hours are going to be spent of your life. So find something that you love and that you're good at, and you'll make the most, make the most difference that way. How did you figure out what was kind of your, your niche within the, the big picture? Hmm. Well, I think that I always had a calling to serve. And it was funny because I was speaking, I don't know, Dave Komen, Heidi, and I speak regularly from the Humane League. And my passion for farmed animals was more like a, a logical one of I want to reduce suffering. And this seemed like a really underserved area. And my but then also combined with my love of animals and it felt like a very, a very natural fit. I thought I had to be a vet to do that. I did not know anything about advocacy or activism as I went through school. And so I was studying to be a vet. And when I finished my zoology degree, my mentor at the time wanted me to do a PhD with him because he, he said to me, Leah, you don't want to be a vet. Vets are plumbers and they fix animals once they're already broken. And you seem like somebody more curious about getting to the root of the problem. And then I, ended up going to Europe to do my master's degree in what was called environment development. It was the first degree like that. There were seven of us in the program um, at King's College, and it was really like a sustainable development degree. And and that's where I discovered a huge professional activism world around farmed animals in the UK. And I could not believe I had never heard of any of this at University of Florida. I couldn't believe there was, you could have a job in this. And that sort of, that was my first job was at Compassionable Farming right out of my master's degree. And I was, you know, 22 years old and that was a long time ago. Yeah. It it seems like you've somewhat specialized in doing communications in your role. You maybe have realized that you're a good communicator. You're very good at telling stories, writing books that that people are interested in here, giving, giving talks. How did you, how did you get good at that? Uh, Or or were you just kind of a a natural? (laughs) You know, that's funny you say that. I think of myself more of a strategist, but then re- more recently, I've been working on our three-year strategy with a consultant and she says, strategy is just a narrative of telling clearly what you're doing and how. So maybe that is what I am. And I, but I do think they're inter interconnected where strategy and telling a clear story are very, very connected. So I really enjoy getting to the root of problems and building pathways to solving them and then telling the story about how to do that and, and helping people build that, that roadmap to get there. I guess maybe I have a slightly biased impression because I read your book and your talks listen to your podcast, <laughs> <laughs> whereas I don't, I don't see you in the board meetings doing, doing, doing the strategy stuff. Yeah. Um, so I'm someone like I'm a communicator in a sense, but I really struggle with doing the doing the personal stuff. I imagine if I was trying to write a book like yours, it would just be time and time again the editor and the publisher coming and saying, "Tell a goddamn story from your life, Rob. Like explain why this is important to you." And I'd be like, yeah. "Oh, here's like some numbers from a spreadsheet." Uh, I actually it- thought a lot about that before I started writing that, and I consulted a lot of uh, people about what style I should follow, and the narrative nonfiction was by far the one people said they would read the most and think through. So I purposely chose that path because I wanted, if I I really wanted to just write a people, a a book to tell people how important chickens are and the facts (laughs) about factory farm, but nobody would read that. So I knew I had, you know, narratives really matter to having people, people don't remember facts, they remember stories. And so it's the story that engages people to then want to do more and learn more. So I, I intentionally wrote it that way because I wanted people to care about chickens and the chicken industry and changing it. Yeah. Is that something that you initially found difficult and, and then got good at? Like, is, is, is there hope for oh, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's hope for you. It was very hard. I actually took a, a narrative nonfiction creative writing class right, um, yeah. and uh, many, many weeks of getting corrected and told to go deeper. <laughs> I was very hard. I, I, you know, I, I read a lot of books that were written in a narrative nonfiction style and immersed myself in that for a couple of years to try to understand how do you tell a story while getting a message through about something, something you want to change. Makes sense. If God came down and said to you, you know, you've got to like, you've got to change your career strategy. I'm like not allowing you to work at Mercy for Animals anymore. I'm not allowing you to work on the kinds of interventions you've been working on. Uh, you, you know, you've got to go do, do something else. What do you think you would go and do? I would probably work on voter rights in the United States. I live in Atlanta and there's been a lot going on if you've been watching the news and I would definitely work on voter rights and the Voter Rights Act in the United States and I would get more at the grassroots political level. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. 
I guess I was thinking you couldn't work at Mercy for animals or on the current interventions, but what, what if you could still work in the, in the, in the animal, animal sphere in general? Are there any other maybe organizations or different approaches that you would be interested in moving to? I, I am very interested in bringing animals into the global UN kind of stage. And so maybe that will be something next time we talk that that will be something we've done. But in the way that climate change is on the global platform and the United Nations and has like conventions, that is a direction I see us go. Like, I really want to do that. If I could start all over again, maybe that would be something I don't think many people are doing and would be interesting to see if he's even worth an intervention. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Interesting. So yeah, what kind of organizations is that? Is that kind of the food and agriculture organization or are there, are there international treaties on these issues? Well, there, there are treaties on other issues like wildlife trade. So there's the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, for example. Could there be a convention on, you know, I don't know. What, there's like the World Food Programs and there's interventions around food and farming, but I don't know enough about that space. And, you know, I just joined a board called the, the World Federation for Animals, which is a brand new organization that's going to be looking at trying to do some of this stuff. And we'll, we'll see. Watch this space. Are there any kind of interesting mistakes that you've seen from from colleagues or other people in the animal movement, which listeners might be able to learn from? Well, I think underplaying culture in an organization and organizational culture and mental health and vacation, for example. I've seen people drive themselves into the ground and think, well, the animals are still in their cages. I don't get a break either. And I've seen a lot of people burn out in my, you know, 20 plus years of working in this movement. And it is a huge loss and can really cause, yeah, tr- tremendous loss if not paid attention to. So I've seen a lot of people deprioritize that when I, as a leader in the organization, am always prioritizing culture, mental health, vacation, like self-care. Yeah. Do you say, you know, require people to take holiday even if, even if they don't want to? Well, I can't quite require them, but we inc- heavily encourage them to do so. And it's very, there's very clear studies about how to create a culture of this, and it starts with me. So I have to go on vacation, and not only do I have to go on vacation, I have to advertise that to the organization. And the other leaders, so if leaders aren't doing it, other people won't do it. So it has to start at the top, and because if your boss isn't taking vacation, you are not going to take vacation. And it's not just, you know, vacation. I, you know, during the pandemic, I was very clear when I was struggling and saying, I have three kids, they were virtual schooling, and it was hard. And I was very clear, like, give me some space. I am not handling this well. And I was vulnerable and said that. And I think it's important for leaders not to pretend like they're just, everything's fine, but to model a culture of vulnerability and transparency and self-care. Yeah. So I guess just to finish, a lot of people who fight against factory farming like struggle with mental health challenges. And I, and I think it's not just because they're working a lot. It's also because the, the work is so confronting, constantly having to like think about the horrible suffering that you're, that you're working to prevent. Yeah. Have you ever become kind of despondent or anxious because of this? And I guess, yeah, how, how did you approach that? And maybe uh, how, do, how do you recommend that other people in the organization approach it? Yeah, I definitely have become despondent and depressed and the severity of the injustice that we're trying to work on. And I really hit a wall in the last summer when was the first trip I took out during the pandemic. And I went to visit a factory farm of one of the transformation farmers. And, you know, I'd been locked up, holed up in my office for nine months. And then the next thing I know, I'm inside of a factory farm filming some of the worst atrocities in the world in my mind. These horrible you know, so chickens with sores, lean chickens, just horrific overcrowding, ammonia, unable to breathe, you know, myself, let alone the chickens. And it really hit me hard. And to realize that this continued, I think during the pandemic, I thought like, oh, maybe, you know, I'd been able to ignore it more. And I had, you know, I hit a real period of depression. And I think that I did a lot to change my life at that point. So I, I think there are a number of things. You have to prioritize self-care. And this means things like exercise regularly, eight hours of sleep, eat healthy. Don't I don't drink at all right now, which is maybe a surprise to people, but I stopped drinking at that point, alcohol, 
you know, you have to do what makes you show up your best self because the work we do is witnessing trauma every single day. We are bearing witness to trauma that is a normalized atrocity in our society. So it's heavy. It is heavy. And, and we're already a, a movement of empaths in many cases. So people who already feel more than others and absorb more than others because we're already, you know, responding to this atrocity when others aren't. So we are especially sensitive to it. And so, and, and you add into that deaths of during the pandemic and me too, and sort of kind of the, 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 the racial uprising issues. It's been a difficult year. It's a lot. And so I think you have to prioritize self-care and I model that for everyone. I insist on vacation. I call, follow up my staff and say like, okay, I can see you haven't taken any vacation. I can, you know, you need to take a break. I'm the type of person who thinks that advocates need more vacation, not less, because we need to last. We have to last the whole time that factory farming exists. And to do that, you need to pace yourself. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And, and self-care is really critical. Yeah. Do you ever have an approach either as an individual, as an organization for what you do when a staff member, you know, they're starting to show signs that maybe they're becoming depressed. Maybe they're like having, you know, serious anxiety at the moment. Uh, and it can be very hard, I think, sometimes for a workplace to, to know what to, what to do at that point. Do you like encourage people to take sick time off? Or? Yeah, we have, um, we have a lot of resources that we offer staff. We have, but we also have maintenance. So we, for example, have courses on that we regularly offer to staff on compassion fatigue. And then in within that workshop, which we ask people to attend, there's resources, books, and different approaches that we, we suggest people take. We also offer people $700 per team member for self-care, and that can be for therapy, it can be for a gym. It's not a whole lot, but it's something in which we're kind of offering to staff. And we know we have mental health leave, and we also have our uh, regular leave. We have quite a number of vacation days, I think more than more than most in the United States, 25 days on top of the, and, and that in Brazil, it's even more. In Mexico, it's around that too. Well, yeah, thanks to you and all your colleagues for uh, the very difficult work that you do, uh, work that I think would certainly <laughs> certainly challenge my mental health. But it seems like it's bearing fruit and uh, hopefully hope things are going to be going to be better in a, in a couple of decades. You might, might even see the, see the back of this thing. I hope so. My, my, uh, my goal is to put us out of business and you know, <laughs> retire on the beach somewhere, put my feet up. Sounds good. My guest today has been uh, Leah Garces. Thanks so much for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Leah. It was my pleasure. It was really fun to talk to you. My colleagues at 80,000 Hours recently tried to turn everything that we've learned about career planning in the last 10 years into an in-depth, step-by-step process uh, for making a career plan. If you're ready to commit a good amount of time, say a couple of days, uh, we think it's worth completing the whole thing. Uh, You can find that at 80,000hours.org slash process. Uh, But I should say that the full article is 20,000 words long. Uh, So if you're just curious about what our advice is, our CEO, Ben Todd, has attempted to compress it down into seven points, one for each section in the full process. You can find that summary at 80,000hours.org slash career hyphen planning slash summary. The whole thing is especially aimed at people who want a career that is both satisfying uh, and has a significant positive impact on the world. Uh, But much of the advice applies to all career decisions. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris, audio mastering by Ben Cordell. Full transcripts are available on our site and made by Sophia Davis-Vogel. Thanks for joining. Talk to you again soon.